Right, good morning everyone, we're gonna get started. Please play, take your seats. Hey, good morning, I'm Justin Moore, uh, Executive Director of the Public Design Commission. I wanted to welcome, welcome you all to our September 16th public meeting. Um, first, thank you to the City Council for letting us use their chamber for our public hearing. Uh, so we'll start today with a vote on our consent agenda before moving to the public hearing. Uh, so during the hearing, each applicant will present their proposal and then we will hear testimony. If you would like to give testimony, please sign up right outside the chamber if you haven't done so already. Names will be called in the order in which they are listed on our sign-up sheet. Please limit your testimony to three minutes and focus on issues of design, which is our purview. If you have printouts of your testimony for our commissioners, please hand it to Carrie over here, uh, who will distribute them to, to our commissioners. During the presentations and testimony, please remain from applause, booing or yelling. Anyone who is disruptive may be escorted out. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Signe for our consent agenda. Thank you, Justin. Um, doesn't make the same noise as upstairs. Um, the public meeting is now commencing with the consent agenda. We have items uh, number 27175 to uh, item 27204. Uh, item 27198 has been withdrawn. So please note the conditions of approval, this is to the commissioners, as recommended by the various committees. Uh, staff has noted uh, Commissioner Morgenthau's recusal from item 27204. Any other uh, recusals to note? Uh, no, for the record, there are no further recusals. So will someone please make a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. A second? Second. Uh, please raise your right hand if you're in favor. Okay. Uh, we appear to have unanimity on approval of the consent agenda. Uh, so now we are going to move on uh, to the public hearing. And the first item uh, on the agenda is item 27205, installation of a prototypical newsstand at 424 East 34th Street in Manhattan. So per standard procedure, um, the applicant will give their presentation, then the public testimony will be heard, and then the commission will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. Um, so as Carrie mentioned before, if you are here to testify and haven't yet signed up, uh, please do so uh, um, outside the chamber by the door. And names will be take read in the order that they are uh, written on the sheet. So uh, let's hear the presentation, please. Will the applicant step forward? Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I like your new setting. I could get used to it. Um, my name is Max Bookman. I'm an attorney and I represent the applicant before the Department of Consumer Affairs for a sidewalk newsstand at 34th Street and 1st Avenue. The applicant is Iqbal Hussein. He's here today accompanied by his son-in-law who helps him with English. If you just stand up for a moment and, and say hello. Um, for over 30 years, uh, the firm started by my father has been representing sidewalk newsstand applicants in this process. I've been doing it for about five years. Um, you don't normally see me at these meetings because by and large our uh, applicants are found, find their way onto your consent agenda. Um, we work with your staff whenever there are issues that they raise with your design guidelines and when we can find common ground, which is often. Uh, we are able to make modifications to our newsstand proposals to meet your guidelines and then make their way onto the consent agenda. Um, I was happy to learn in this particular application that the reason that I've been invited here to speak is not because I have a dispute with your staff. Uh, your staff and I agree that this newsstand does meet your design guidelines that you have published and that you hold all sidewalk newsstands uh, accountable for. Um, my understanding as to why we're here today is because there has been some opposition raised to this sidewalk newsstand which is present today. Um, so I would just like to say as a general matter before we hear from the opposition and generally when I have been before you, um, 
if there's opposition, I, you know, we hear it and then you ask questions and so I'd like to have an opportunity to res briefly respond to whatever opposition is raised. But just as a general matter, um, since there are not many sidewalk newsstands that are not on your consent agenda, uh, just to remind the commission that this is a multi-agency process, the approval for sidewalk newsstands. It, at this point, it takes several years to complete. Um, the community board gets a chance to weigh in, as well as the Department of Transportation, which uh, is responsible for the objective siting criteria for sidewalk newsstands. There are many objective siting criteria, they are complicated, and before any sidewalk newsstand makes it to your commission, it is reviewed by the Department of Transportation. And then you. Everybody has a role to play in this process, and as was mentioned, I believe, by the executive director at the outset, your role is, is design. And so, um, to the extent that this newsstand does um, uh, impact any sort of design questions, I just want to raise and bring you up to speed on what transpired between communications between my office and your staff during their review of this process. So as was standard after the Department of Transportation uh, approved this newsstand and it went to your staff for review, we submitted, I'm just going to skip ahead, uh, your, the standard materials which you ask for, which is, I'm not going to really belabor this, but this is just a, an overall plan of the area. The red square you see is the sidewalk newsstand, the approved plan from the Department of Transportation with all of the uh, objective siting criteria, and then this is what your folks ask for, which is a, a photoshopped view of the newsstand from various angles. After that was submitted to you, your staff asked, after getting some feedback from the community board, that we provide a few more photographs in response to a concern that was raised about the newsstand potentially, let me get to a good one, potentially blocking lines of sight to spot the I don't know, maybe 50 feet tall uh, Dalmatian juggling a taxi cab statute, um, statue. And that is certainly within your purview to consider. Um, so uh, we provided, I want to get to the good ones, um, some photoshopped, some additional photoshopped uh, slides. Here they are. Um, from various angles looking at spot. Um, and as you could see from these photos which I've, that we photoshopped also handing out, if anything blocks spot, it's the trees that have been planted in front of it, not uh, the newsstand. The newsstand from any angle, unless you're basically standing with your nose touching the newsstand, um, uh, does not block spot. Your staff agreed with that determination and let me know that, but nevertheless we're here today due to some opposition. So what I would respectfully ask at this time is uh, you hear from testimony from whatever opposition there is and then to the extent that uh, response to that is needed, uh, I, would, I would be happy to provide that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, uh, four people that have signed up to testify. Um, the, pers uh, the first person is Council Member Keith Powers. Do we have a representative of um, Council Member Powers here? Okay, well, if they come in, we will um, put them at the end. So the next person is um, Joseph Loda from NYU Langone. Thank you and good morning. My name is Joe Loda. I'm uh, Vice Dean and Chief of Staff at NYU Langone Medical Center. I'm here to convey NYU Langone's strong opposition to the new stand application uh, proposed to be, uh, and the new stand proposed to be located at East 34th Street and First Avenue. It's adjacent to our main campus superblock, which is uniquely incorporates the unimpeded area that stretches from East 34th Street to uh, East 30th Street and from First Avenue uh, to the FDR Drive. Our opposition is based on aesthetic reasons as well as significant material implications. Specifically, our proposed, uh, the proposed newsstand will, one, create a street wall that blocks existing signage at the hospital, uh, two, blocks views of artwork, and three, contributes to visual clutter. Additionally, we are opposed because it will directly interfere with emergency operations in the event of a mass casualty incident. Let me address the st street wall issue and the blockage of the signage. 
Uh, as you will see from the poster boards that are on the opposite side of the room uh, that we are displaying, the proposed new stand will obstruct the hospital's wayfinding signs as well as the entrance to our inpatient buildings, most notably Tisch Hospital. We are literally, and we literally receive thousands of patients and families and visitors daily, and we make a concerted effort to ensure wayfinding signs and entrances that are visible, unobstructed, and easily accessible. In, med in a medically stressful and uncertain situations, ease of access is paramount. The direct, uh, the direct obstruction of our wayfinding signs would be uh, extremely problematic for vehicles and pedestrians who are traveling eastbound on 34th Street seeking to access the hospital. Blockage of this sight line will cause confusion and delay as the next possible turn on 34th Street uh, would be actually onto the FDR Drive going south. Any vehicle that accidentally misses the entrance would be forced to drive down FDR Drive uh, service road until they get to East 26th Street, adding significant time, sometimes as long as 10 minutes, since the vehicle will need to pass the 30th Street Men's Homeless Shelter, the entire Bellevue Hospital Center complex, the Administration for Children's Services Children's Center, and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner before they get to NYU Langone. Blockage of signage is unfortunate, unnecessary, and completely avoidable. And finally, the proposed newsstand will impede on critical operations in the event of a healthcare-related citywide emergency. For example, in the event of a mass casualty incident that results in patients that might be contaminated presenting in the emergency room at Tisch Hospital for treatment, the proposed structure will definitely interfere. For example, when there's a steam pipe explosion, which unfortunately has happened uh, more than frequently here in our city, people are exposed to asbestos and need to be decontaminated prior to entering the ER. The site of the proposed newsstand is exactly where the designated decontamination facility uh, is to be set up and patients are staged for triage. Can please wrap up. Will do. In the event of an evacuation of patients from the hospital, uh, the site of the proposed newsstand is right smack in the middle of the designated staging area. I'd like to highlight one additional thing, and I'll take another 20 seconds. Uh, right behind the building, that building that's uh, brown and behind it, immediately adjacent to the newsstand is the Amtrak service building. This houses the air vent and emergency exit for the East River Rail Railroad tunnels. These tunnels operate 24-7, 365, and they carry all Amtrak trains between Penn Station and Boston, okay. and, that, and all, absolutely all, Long Island Railroad trains that terminate okay, you at can Penn Station. The rest of These your... buildings are critical to yeah. providing Sir, fresh air and that. provide all emergency exits going on. Accordingly, NYU Langone is in uh, opposition uh, to the uh, facilitating the building of this uh, newsstand at this site, and we are totally opposed. Thank you, and I apologize for going over. Thank you. Um, our third speaker uh, is Jesus Perez from Community Board 6. Good morning, President Nielsen. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Jesus Perez. I'm the District Manager of Manhattan Community Board 6. I'm here to speak in opposition to item 27205, which Community Board 6 unanimously, unanimously voted to object to in April of this year. You've been provided with a copy of the resolution. Like the Public Design Commission, Manhattan Community Board 6 cares very deeply about the aesthetics of the built environment within our neighborhoods. We share the Public Design Commission's stated mission to advocate for innovative and sustainable design in order to improve the public realm. Approving this new stand would not advance that mission. Since the start of this century, the print media industry has been on the decline to construct a structure whose purpose, by the licensing agency's very own admission, is primarily for the use of the sale of newspapers and periodicals is not innovative. There were previously newsstands at 2nd Avenue and 34th Street, as well as 2nd Avenue and 33rd Street, just steps from the proposed location. Both failed within a year of installation and then remained vacant for years, taking up valuable sidewalk space and being an unattractive reminder of a bad decision. These abandoned newsstands were only removed after several years of community activism 
and ultimately intervention by Community Board 6. There is nothing that gives us confidence that the proposed new stand at 34th Street will avoid a similar fate of being shuttered and turning into an aesthetic eyesore in our community. Approving this application would certainly not be consistent with the Public Design Commission's stated mission of enhancing the public realm. Given how difficult it is to remove new stands once they have failed, there should be a concerted effort to get applicants to take up shop in one of the shuttered new stand structures before seeking to construct a new one, but they do not. Why would they if the location was unsuccessful? And none of the agencies that review the new stand applications compel them to. Instead, they approve the building of even more new stands that are likely to fail, only to leave a trail of shuttered new stands in their wake. How does this advance the Public Design Commission's mission of promoting sustainable design? The current procedure is wasteful and certainly not sustainable. And while the new stand operator can easily move on, it is the residents of our community who get stuck with the consequences. The members of Community Board 6 are not unlike all of you, the distinguished members of the Public Design Commission. You both are concerned, involved citizens who all volunteer your time to work for the best interests of the people of New York. As the people who know their communities best, our opinion should be borne in mind and given particular consideration. Community board members volunteer their time to review newsstand applications. We know the sidewalks of our district. We walk by these sites every day. As fellow champions of our great city's public spaces, Manhattan Community Board 6 urges the PDC to reject this application. Thank you. Perfect timing, thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, let me just ask, as, as a representative or as council member, uh, Keith Powers here? Okay, so our last speaker, uh, Brian Lafferty of Manhattan Borough President Brewer. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and testify today. My name is Brian Lafferty. I am testifying on behalf of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer in opposition to the proposed prototypical newsstand at 424 East 34th Street. First, Manhattan Community Board 6 has developed guidelines for the siting of newsstands, which are publicly available and were sent to the applicants before they appeared before the Community Board's Transportation Committee. The Community Board voted unanimously to object to this proposed newsstand siting at its April 10th, 2019 full board meeting on the basis that the applicants did not adhere to, the, to its newsstand siting guidelines. A 38-foot sculpture, the NYU Langone Helen L. and Martin S. Kimmel Pavilion, and signage for NYU Langone would be obstructed by the newsstand. Furthermore, the space where the proposed newsstand is sited for is currently utilized by NYU Langone for emergencies and patients who are dropped off at this location who would be negatively impacted. When mere seconds can dictate life or death, it would be unconscionable to cite a newsstand in a location that would create a physical and physical, visual obstruction to a healthcare facility. In addition, there is also the possibility that a newsstand at this location may not be open for a significant period of time. In fact, according to Manhattan Community Board 6's April 10, 2019 resolution, there were previously two newsstands in close proximity to this location, both of which failed within a year, but were only removed after several years of community activism. Moreover, there is already a convenience store that sells similar merchandise within 500 feet of this location. I urge you to reject the siting of a prototypical newsstand on the basis that it would be a disservice to those who appreciate the sculpture and to those seeking health care and emergency services. This may well become yet another unoccupied newsstand contributing to neighborhood blight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bookman, is there something you'd like to respond to? Yes, thank you, briefly. I'm not going to respond uh, point by point, but just a few general comments in, in response to the, some of the, the categories of, of objections that we just heard. So uh, first on the category of objection having to do with uh, public safety, uh, I've 
said it before, I've heard members of this commission say before, it, it is not your purview, and that's not a disparaging remark against this commission. It's just this is a multi-agency process. Each agency is required to bring its expertise to bear to answer a particular question that it's required to answer in the process. And the question that you have been asked to answer has to do with your contextual review and adherence to your design guidelines, not questions of public safety. Um, I think, suffice it to say, however, um, the Department of Transportation does have a citing criteria having to do with uh, hazardous conditions, um, which they have brought to bear in the past in uh, new stands that they felt improperly impeded emergency access uh, to a hospital. Um, and I didn't hear today, by the way, that this driveway is the emergency room entrance. Um, but even if it was, again, outside of this commission's purview, but I don't think that's the case. Um, and so DOT had their opportunity to consider that, and we got an approval from DOT. Um, the second category of objection that I believe uh, you know, can be gleaned from the comments is a more general statement about the role of newsstands on the public sidewalks today. And so, you know, although I don't think that uh, this commission's role is to answer the meta question about whether it would be a good idea to continue having newsstands or whether, generally speaking, it would be a good idea to have a newsstand at this location, I'm here to tell you that it would be a good idea in any event, and here's why. Newsstands have been a historic part of the fabric of the New York City streetscape for more than a century. And that began with the sale of periodicals, but expanded to a number of convenience items from the initial, the first after, after um, newspapers, it was tobacco they were permitted to sell, and then items under $5, that number was expanded to items under $10, candy, bottled water, items that are convenient for New Yorkers who don't have a time, the time, don't have a New York minute to go into a store to get these items. They can get it without breaking a step on the public sidewalk. More specifically, as it pertains to hospitals, newsstands have historically been situated in front of hospitals because they are particularly convenient for hospital staff and for people who go to those hospitals. Um, however, there is an equally long tradition of hospitals not wanting newsstands in front of them. And although my, my face it may appear young, I'm old enough to suspect that the hospital was able to reach out to certain elected officials to ask them to comment today on this newsstand application. Um, but I believe uh, we can all agree that not, newsstands are situated in front of public, in, in front of hospitals, and the sky has not fallen, nor will it, he will it here. Um, just two more very brief points. One is, as it relates to the only comment that I did here regarding design and contextual review, um, it is that you've heard that some folks believe that this sidewalk newsstand does impede lines of sight to spot, and I would just only reiterate that uh, I, don't, I think your staff reached the right conclusion by uh, recommending to you that it does not. Um, again, if anything, the trees that they planted in front of the sculpture block it far more than the newsstand at any reasonable angle. And then this, the last comment I want to make is about your guidelines more generally. Um, I have, uh, on rare, I'd like to say occasion, uh, had applications rejected by your commission. And when I have, I've been, it's generally be beca been because the application that I submitted um, did not adhere to your guidelines, but I nevertheless asked, uh, took a gamble and asked you to overrule your staff. And the sort of the, the response that I generally get when I come to this commission with that sort of request is that we like to stick to our guidelines. And I think um, when newsstand applicants get the detriment of, of, of that side of the coin, that's, you know, that is what it is, but uh, they ought to get the benefit of the other side of the coin as well. In this case, um, I think it's obviously it's for you to make the ultimate decision on, but my respectful submission to you, uh, along with that of your staff, is that this meets your guidelines, and notwithstanding any other uh, irrelevant concerns to your consideration, um, this new stand ought to be approved. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bookman. Um, all right, commissioners, um, before we take a vote, any opinions, comments? That's unusual. Um, <laughs> I'll just say I think actually that Mr. Bookman made very good and appropriate uh, comments with regard to this. Um, obviously, our ears perk up when we are faced with a, um, the possibility of risking public safety. 
Um, but as you pointed out, and I just want to say this for the members of the um, public who might be here, um, that it is DOT's responsibility to uh, weigh in on that point um, and uh, that we cannot really take a position on it, but nonetheless, we are not um, blind to concerns of public safety. So thank you for um, clarifying that. And um, so I think on the basis of um, no comments from uh, our commissioners, uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve? Oh. I'm going to recuse myself from this vote. Uh, with that recusal, anyone else here like to make a motion? I move the adoption. Uh, do we have a second on adopting this proposal? Second. Okay, we have a second. Um, all in favor, please raise your right hand with the exception of um, Commissioner. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is a majority. This is approved. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just say for there was one uh, negative vote, one abstention. One abstention. Uh, two abstentions. Two abstentions, all right. All right, we are now going to uh, move on uh, to the next item, uh, item number 27206, the Women's Rights Pioneer Monument. Um, as a reminder again, applicants will make their presentation uh, public testimony will then be heard, and the commission will then ask uh, questions, deliberate, and vote. Um, uh, Carrie Butler will read four names at a time uh, so that you can uh, be prepared to give your testimony. Uh, and a reminder, um, no yelling, booing, or cheering. Um, and uh, you are limited to uh, three minutes, and there's a clock over there for your guidance. Shall I start? Yes, please. I'm Pam Elam, president of Monumental Women, and it's not often that all of us have a part and a chance to be a part in something that's truly historic. As we all know, because of our Women's Rights Pioneers Monument, next year New York City will be at the center of a national celebration honoring the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Votes for Women Amendment to the Constitution. Other important women's history programs and events sponsored by Monumental Women will start later this year as part of our education campaign. Our challenge to municipalities will reach well beyond the boundaries of New York City as we send our message all across this nation, urging cities to reimagine their public spaces to include more tributes to all women and people of color. Little did we know that we would have to constantly challenge our own municipality to move forward on this issue and to respect and celebrate this important anniversary. But as is said, we persisted and will continue to do so. Today we want to remind you of the real issues and the real possibilities of this project. We thank our supporters who are here today to testify, as well as those like Gloria Steinem, Lily Tomlin, Jane Wagner, and the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites, who have sent in strong statements of support, which have been forwarded to Carrie to give to you. We thank our good friend, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, for the great op-ed in the New York Daily News today, and we do also thank the Daily News for that wonderful editorial endorsement of our statue in the paper today. We want to underscore the importance of this moment. In less than a year, the unveiling of the statue will take place. We have stayed on schedule despite the many often conflicting 
demands that have been presented by both the PDC and City Hall. Today we want to concentrate on what this whole project is supposed to be about, a beautiful work of art and honoring the continuing fight for women's equality. We're pleased to make our presentation today to the full commission. We haven't had the opportunity to see most of you during the last six months, and Meredith has not had the opportunity to describe directly to all of you her vision and her process in creating this amended design. Finally, she gets to do so now, and I am pleased to introduce our wonderful sculptor, Meredith Bergman. Thank you, Pam, and thank you to the Public Design Commission. Uh, good morning. As an artist working in the public realm, I approach each project with an eye on integrating four compatible but different concerns. The people to be commemorated and their history, the site, our contemporary needs, and my own interest in creating the artwork. My own interest is easiest to describe. I've worked for decades for social justice and historical redress through my art, as in the Boston Women's Memorial from 2003, using my artist's imagination to create empathic representations of diverse, inspiring people. The site for this commission is on Literary Walk in Central Park, which is visited by over 42 million people each year, that is the whole park. I've used some of the vocabulary of the existing statuary in the park so that this monument will speak to and harmoniously coexist with the park's art collection, including Shakespeare, Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott, and directly across from our site, Fitzgreen Halleck, a popular satirical poet of the 19th century. Our site fits in between an established overhanging elm tree and a spot where an elm tree should and perhaps soon will be planted, preserving the symmetry of the cathedral-like living architecture of the mall. Within this structure, my design departs from the other monuments in ways that are appropriate to the entry of women into a sphere from which we were previously excluded. Not one but three figures share an oval pedestal and relate to each other. The monument in scale to the others is 14 feet high, but these figures of women are not dreaming, but working. They're an allegory of sisterhood, cooperation, and activism, but they are not just an allegory, as so many sculptures of women are, and you can see some on the ceiling representing the burrows, um, somewhat undraped. In this way, I am making a contemporary work that will harmonize with its 19th century surroundings. Here's the one-third height clay model for the monument. The sculptures portray three aspects of women's rights activism. Sojourner Truth is speaking, Susan B. Anthony is organizing, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is writing. Sojourner Truth sits with Elizabeth Cady Stanton at a small table, perhaps on the occasion of a conference for the abolition of slavery or for women's rights, or both, as these movements were for much of their history joined in activism. Susan B. Anthony is standing behind the table with her traveling bag, bringing documentation of injustices to help focus the discussion. The historical record is complex, as are the people I'm portraying. The women might be meeting in Stanton's home, where both Sojourner Truth and Anthony were guests. The monument represents an indoor space because much of women's political work originated in the home. In the 19th century, women were not commonly seen in the public sphere, and we have them to thank for my presence here today and the presence of all you female commissioners and speakers to come. My portraits of these women are complex, showing their attention to and respect for each other and through their body language and subtle aspects of their facial expressions, some of the tensions among them. Professor Margaret Washington, historian and author of Sojourner Truths America, 2011, put it beautifully when she wrote to me, there ought to be a way to depict that, to capture the sisterhood as well as the differences. Statues serve many purposes in addition to portraying a likeness of a person, and the best portraits evoke a whole life and are not fixed in a particular moment in time. And by the way, these are models for what will be finished portraits three times their size. So there's a great deal of work and detail yet to come. These are not the things that will go in Central Park, not yet. 
Sculptural portraits can do this very well because they're made as composites, formed from many impressions, and because they're designed to be seen from many angles at different times of day in changing light. Here's Sojourner Truth in her 60s. Whoops. Sorry. And in her late 80s. Elizabeth Cady Stanton at 39, already the mother of several children, and in her 60s as the mother of seven. Susan B. Anthony at 30, and in her 50s. Sojourner Truth used photography to establish her identity and sold her image to support herself, copywriting her own image and adding a caption, I, shall, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Hang on, I missed her. No, it's missing. Sorry, there's a missing slide. Here she wears a silk shawl and a brocade jacket. There she is. So she's wearing fine clothing, but earlier she had herself photographed as she appeared as an itinerant abolitionist speaker and preacher. She openly displays her injured right hand with its amputated finger. Inscribed on the pedestal are the three women's names placed in order from left to right so the statues can be identified by name for those who will not recognize them at first glance, along with the inscription, Women's Rights Pioneers. Seated Truth is eight feet high, Stanton is seven feet high, and Anthony Standing is nine feet high. The oval pedestal is five feet, including a four-inch bronze plinth and a six-inch granite base. In response to feedback, I've made the pedestal far simpler than the ones under the male statues on the walk. I did have to keep the bronze plinth atop the granite for visual and also structural reasons. It's far safer and better to anchor the statues to the bronze base than to try to drill into the granite and the concrete core while installing all these different disparate elements. The rectangular granite base is necessary for aesthetic reasons to provide a visual monument, foundation to the monument, to define its space, to prevent it from looking like it's sinking into the grass, and to harmonize with the surrounding monuments. This aesthetic decision was made in consultation with monumental women, Bayer Blinder Bell, the Parks Department, and the Central Park Conservancy. A bronze plaque on the back of the pedestal will contain these acknowledgments. This statue has been donated to the City of New York by the Monumental Women's Statue Fund, an all-volunteer nonprofit group dedicated to increasing knowledge of the importance of women's history. The statue by Meredith Gang Bergman was dedicated on August 26, 2020, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Votes for Women Amendment to the United States Constitution. Monumental Women's educational campaign will be reaching out to as many diverse stakeholders as possible to contribute to the ongoing framing of this message and this monument. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Carrie, you have the... I already gave to you. you Thank you. It. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be very brief. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm simply going to state that we have, as you uh, know, been working on this for about five years, it seems. And I want to congratulate the mayor's office and the monumental women and everyone who has made sure that this is a diverse inclusion statue. It is a very exciting location. It is a very exciting time. Um, these three women, there are historians in the audience, much more so than I am, and on the panel, but these three women had uh, good times and bad times, and I think it's very exciting to see them all together. God knows in today's world that doesn't happen, so it's nice to know that it did happen at one point. And I think we're all used to trying to figure out how we can work together, 
um, have our disagreements and come back together. Um, the other issue that's exciting, with all due respect to what the mayor's office has been doing, the Monumental Women started early on with there are only five statues of women in the city of New York, and for God's sake, we need A, more, and B, at least one in Central Park. So that is also exciting. And I also want to think, say that I think Meredith is a phenomenal uh, sculptor. She has uh, the intelligence. She has the commitment. She's done statues of many different kinds of women in the past. And um, to have her be part of this is a real honor. So as you saw, we have a daily news editorial. We're all trying to figure out how we vote in general. But it's good to be reminded that uh, some people got the vote uh, some hundred years ago. Uh, some people got it later. And all of this, we need to be reminded over and over again, given what we're dealing with in the world today. So congratulations. Um, I look forward to you uh, being supportive. But I also want to thank you for all of the comments that you've made, both as a board and as a staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next speaker. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, my name is Brenda Berkman and I'm a member of the board of Monumental Women. I'm also the education program director for Monumental Women. I have a BA and an MA in American history and I'm the steward of several women's history archives at the Wagner Labor Archives at NYU. In my life, I have not just studied history, I made history as a sole named class plaintiff in the federal sex discrimination lawsuit that resulted in the hiring of New York City's first women firefighters excuse me, firefighters, and I retired from the FDNY after 25 years as a captain. In the course of my career, I experienced many instances where women firefighters were held to much higher standards than their male co-workers, where there was, in essence, a double standard and rules that were created to thwart women's opportunities. I've also experienced how the power of women role models and images of strong, heroic women can inspire girls and young women to be brave in their own lives, even to become firefighters, and how the lack of such powerful role models and the lack of images of strong women causes girls and boys, women and men, to believe that women are not capable of being firefighters or anything else. I've seen how in my own lifetime, the media, historians, teachers, politicians, and other people in control of the message have erased women firefighters and women deserving of the same recognition as their male peers. For me, history is both living and important. As I travel and speak around the country, I talk to folks in New York City and in other areas of the country about monumental women's Central Park statue and our education campaigns, people from all walks of life, all regions, all races, all genders, immediately grasp the importance of the symbolism of having these three women's rights pioneers in Central Park. They get how this statue is not the perfect answer to a lack of women and people of color in public spaces, but it is an important start. People get how this statue represents how all women can and should work together to bring about greater equality. That although these women and other pioneers made mistakes and were imperfect, they fought for the rights we take for granted today. People are not only excited about the unveiling of the statue on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the 200th anniversary of Susan B. Anthony's birthday, some are planning to travel to New York City to attend our unveiling ceremony. I would respectfully ask that the New York City Public Design Commission give these three women heroes, Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, the visibility, honor, and recognition they greatly deserve by approving Meredith Bergman's Women's Rights Pioneers Central Park statue design immediately so that the monument is ready in time for the August 26, 2020 unveiling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Yes, my name is Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, and I will read a statement on behalf of Jacob Morris, the uh, executive director of the Harlem Historical Society. 
As the director of the Harlem Historical Society, having been involved with public history matters in the city for decades, I express my deep frustration at how this design approval process has advanced. For a month after announcing that their new design would incorporate Sojourner Truth, the Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony Statue Fund Incorporated kept all design images confidential, even as they were involved with deliberation processes with public agencies, the Departments of Parks and Recreation, and the Public Design Commission. Meanwhile, the fund falsely claimed on their website that the Public Design Commission was responsible for their unwillingness to share the design. Yet, on a Wednesday, September 11th, the Executive Director of the Public Design Commission, Justin Garrett Moore, explicitly affirmed that this statement on the statue fund website was, quote, not accurate. I appreciate that senior staff of the Design Commission was willing to admonish the false statement by the Stanton and Anthony Statue Fund in this manner. Furthermore, only days before this meeting, members of a few select community boards were able to see the proposed design at public meetings, yet in a secretive manner where public attendees of the meetings could not see the images. I believe that this occurred in violation of sunshine laws that applied to community boards, since there was nothing in these images that dealt with sensitive records such as personnel matters. The only conceivable reason for all of this secrecy was to avoid the type of criticism that their previous design received. This fear, however, was unfounded, and the fund should have, no, have had nothing to be afraid of. Indeed, the Harlem Historical Society has no objection to the fundamental features of the design, as we have been able to ascertain them. While the design does represent a single moment in time after the Civil War, when black and white suffrage activists align in their objectives and work together, we, d we acknowledge that this moment did exist. For the purposes of civic and societal unity and pride, it is understandable that the statue fund would want to represent, quote, a kumbaya moment of togetherness. The sculptor Meredith Bergman has also demonstrated her commitment to design an altered monument that is sensitive to the critiques that have been expressed. Yet, for the sake of historical accuracy and public education, it is critical that the text on the plaque below, on the pedestal below, and there must be a contextual plaque, provide sufficient historical context regarding the different objectives among the suffrage activists. This text, which should be drafted in consultation with leading experts on the subject, needs to make some of the important distinctions that the monument itself will not make. Therefore, our position is that the preliminary approval for this monument design should not constitute approval for the statute fund to draft their own plaque text. Rather, plaque text, which should be required, must be subject to a separate approval uh, process by the Public Design Commission. Given that the Design Commission has been tasked with deliberation on such sensitive historical matters, we also argue that going forward, the Commission must always include a commissioner who is an experienced and capable historian. In fact, we would advance that the enabling legislation for the Design Commission be amended to include a requirement that a historian be seated on the Commission. The fact that you are now having to vote again on a monument that was previously approved yet found egregious by historians around the country shows the urgent need for this reform. Thank you. Thank you. Remarkable. Um. Good morning. My name is Colleen. Oops. I'm sorry. Good morning. My name is Colleen Jenkins. For the past six years, I've served as vice president um, of the statue campaign. I'm also the great, great granddaughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. As well, my great-grandmother, Harriet, read newspapers and suffrage journals to Sojourner Truth. I want to make two points about design by making a comparison of this statue proposed with an existing 100-year-old statue in the US Capitol Rotunda in Washington, DC. The DC statue was a gift to the nation in recognition of the ratification of the 19th Amendment universal suffrage in 1920. In the Capitol Rotunda, the public art consists of three women, three suffragists, who are gathered around a central part, point. The three women are rising out of three tons of rough-hued Carrara marble. The artist's vision is that the women are rising out of tyranny. Ultimately, the viewer of this public art can interpret the piece in any way she or he chooses. This is the beauty of public art. My second point concerns public opinion about the content of the suffrage statue in Washington, DC. In 1998, when this statue was proposed to move out of the crypt of the Capitol to the rotunda of the Capitol, a protest occurred. I went to the protest meeting at the AME Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., where Dr. C. Dolores Tucker and Dick Gregory spoke. Their point was that Church, so Turner Truth should be carved into this sculpture 
which was about 100 years old. This did not happen. In any case, the voices of Dr. C. Dolores Tucker and Dick Gregory are ringing in my ears today. I hear them saying, add so Turner truth now. At this very moment, we can do that. I close my remarks with the text of the 19th Amendment, the right of citizenship of the United States, all right, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Next year, August 26, is the 100th anniversary of our constitutional right to vote. It is a right we fought for and we must continue to fight for. In gratitude and inspiration, we give this statue of women's pioneers to the nation. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning. Thank you to everyone on the council for hearing my testimony today. My name is Eileen McDonald. I'm a New York City stagehand. I work backstage on Broadway, and now I can't get you tickets to Hamilton. <laughs> I'm here today to talk about visibility. Our goal working backstage is to not be seen. I get paid to not be seen. We razzle-dazzle audiences every day, but we are invisible. Sadly, women have been taught the same lesson. I'm a proud member of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Local One. Our union was formed in 1886, about 30 years after Central Park was created. We do the lights and sound and build scenery for Broadway, television, Radio City, The Met, etc. We have 3,500 members and about 200 are women. 200 women who have been told to keep our head down and our mouth shut. Working in a male-dominated field has its own challenges, but we have come a long way in our union. Eight years ago, we started the first Women's Committee, and the very first resolution we brought to our all-male executive board was the idea of this monumental women statue in Central Park. It was approved unanimously. Local One is proud to be the first union in New York City to endorse this monument. <clears throat> we understand how important it is for girls to have role models. There are dozens of statues in Central Park. And what does it say to little girls and little boys who walk through and not even see one woman being honored? Now Monumental Women is giving New York City a chance to see three extraordinary women, three extraordinary New Yorkers. Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. When the Susan B. Anthony dollar came out in 1979, I didn't even know who she was. I had never heard of Sojourner Truth until I started to study labor history. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's name meant nothing to me until I put it together that one of the guys in our orchestra is a direct descendant. Yes, we have living relatives living right here in New York City. <laughs> August 26, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Women finally won the constitutional right to vote. Unveiling this statue next summer will be an incredible opportunity to see women of different races, religions, and economic status working together to fight for justice and equality. New York City prides itself on being at the forefront. We have the money, we have a location, we have an artist. Vote now to approve the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. Let's do everything we can to support monumental women's vision for a grand celebration next summer. Let's give our kids something to look up to. And let's make Central Park the room where it happens. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Namita Luthra. I'm a board member of Monumental Women. For years, I was a litigator at the ACLU Women's Rights Project, and I've also served on a board called Saki for South Asian Women. In addressing the great city of New York, you all, I want to reference another great world city, London. 
Its first monument to a woman in Parliament Square went up a year ago. Up until then, all the statues in Parliament Square were of men and by men. That changed when suffragist Millicent Fawcett was commemorated in a ceremony that was attended by the Prime Minister, London's Mayor Sadiq Khan, um, the Labour Party leader, other ministers of parliament, and the public. Theresa May rightly said that women wouldn't be in parliament had it not been for the six decades that Millicent Fawcett and countless other women fought to secure women the right to vote. The Prime Minister said that the statue will not only serve as a reminder to generations to come of Fawcett's life and legacy, but as an inspiration to all of us who wish to follow in her footsteps. The mayor had made the um, statue's unveiling a priority in his first few weeks in office. Labor leader Jeremy Corbyn said it was a great first step, but there is a lot more to be done. The sculptor is a woman named um, Gillian Waring. She was the first woman to design and create a, uh, a statue in Parliament Square. She was asked specifically if the depiction of Millicent Fawcett holding a banner that says, courage calls to courage everywhere, whether that image came from something specific did it come from a portrait or a photographic image? Here's the answer that that sculptor gave. She said, no, there are not many images of Fawcett at this age. There were a few of her sitting at a desk, wearing a walking suit, and in the statue, she is wearing a walking suit. But the sculptor wanted to put this banner in her hands that says, courage calls to courage everywhere because it was a rallying cry, and it was also in honor of her fellow suffragist who died in 1913 during a protest. The hearing today is a call to action, an awakening to the absence of women in political and cultural life. This is a national and international conversation. Great cities are responding, and we are so happy that New York City is as well. Your courage here will be a call to courage everywhere, in small towns across the country where there is no representation of women who built those small towns. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. My name is Judeline Cassidy, and I'm a proud member of Monumental Women, and I'm also a proud union member of Plumbers Local Union No. 1 for the past 20 years. Getting girls, young girls excited about working within the construction industry is my passion. I founded the nonprofit organization Tools and Tiaras Inc. to foster the lasting curiosity and interest among girls and women to encourage them to consider careers as electricians, carpenters, plumbers, and other skilled trades. As part of our New York City's uh, construction skills camp this summer, our girls work with monumental women on an art project called Put Her on a Pedestal. The girls were given biographical materials about the variety of suffrages and asked to draw a suffrage who inspired them and to write about women whose life inspired them. We brought few of the images. These are some of the images the girls made at camp of different women suffrages. Uh, Autumn Domingo wrote, the reason I want to honor Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton was because even though she was just as bright as the boys, she was put down by people around her. I think that, is, that was because she was put down because of her gender. It motivated her to make change. She did many things. Uh, she did many things and for future generations. Thank you, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, for all you fought for, even when it was really hard. Of Sojourner Truth, 
another girl named Penelope Amaya wrote, she attended many women suffrages meetings and made speeches. She wanted equality for all women. The young girls and women I work with inspi uh, inspired by the images of a historical woman who fought for women's rights and was surprised and upset that the statue of women they admired didn't already exist in Central Park. They totally get the importance of working of the work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and other women who did, who did create more opportunities for girls and women. The girls in my program and everywhere expect and need these women role models in our public spaces to be visible. This beautiful statue by Meredith Berkman will provide girls like my princess warriors and so many other girls and boys who visit Central Park and with an example of three women who represent how all women can work together to achieve full equality for all. And I believe that Central Park is the place and New York City is always number one. So let's continue to be number one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sharon Nelson, and I am the CEO of Civically Reengaged Women. I'm here this morning to testify on behalf of the work and mission of Monumental Women. And like Monumental Women crew, enfranchises women and girls to embrace their role models and elevate those role models into immortal examples of bravery, courage, leadership, and so on. For females past and pre for females present and future to be inspired and to emulate, Monumental Women augments the greatness of women leaders, regardless of race, sexual orientation, creed, ethnic origin, or religion, by memorializing their likeness in tributary statues. Today, as unsung women, we insist that the Public Design Commission and the Mayor's Office know how strong the support is for our women's rights pioneer monument featuring prominent New Yorkers, Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony. Somehow, in 2019, the notion of memorializing women in statues was not as welcome as we thought it would be. And we have to attend hearings like this one today and endure um, visceral attacks via the press just to get our point across. And now there is a new bronze ceiling which has been erected in Central Park, which we have to break. And here are the facts. For the past six years, Monumental Women's Statue Fund, an all-volunteer, not-for-profit group, has fought to honor women's rights pioneers by breaking the bronze ceiling and to create the first statue of real women in nearly 166 years of history in Central Park. The statue honoring New Yorkers Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton must, I'll say it again, must be unveiled on August 26, 2020 in time for the celebration of the centennial anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution when women finally got the constitutional right to vote. They have raised private funding, meaning monumental women, to build this monument through uh, and battle through every bureaucratic obstacle to make it happen. There is no doubt that Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are women's rights pioneers and deserve to be honored. They are contemporaries and have often worked together and attended the same meetings and conventions. We are questioning why this is, why this, why is this history making monument so long to be approved by the city? 
Monumental Women has been trying to work with the New York City Public Design Commission for almost a year now. Monumental Women and sculptor Meredith Bregman have deadlines and schedules for this competition, completion of this historic monument, and that must be kept. It matters that boys and girls have diverse and relatable women role models. The statue shows women of different races, religions, and economic status working together to fight for justice and equality. Sorry, we need to wrap up. Okay, please now <laughs> vote to approve Women's Rights Pioneers Monument and, and can do everything and do everything you can to support monument, Monumental Women's Plan for a wonderful 2020 celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Haig. I'll be sharing testimony on behalf of Congresswoman Carolyn B. Maloney. I'm pleased to thank the New York City Public Design Commission for allowing me to present testimony today at the preliminary hearing on the installation of the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument by Meredith Bergman. I am privileged to represent the communities located directly south and east of Central Park, and I am extremely supportive of the planned siting of the monument along the literary walk at the southern end of the mall. New York City has a long history of recognizing important historical figures in statuary, but to date there are less than 10 statues of historical women in the entire city. Indeed, among the scores of statues in Central Park, there is not a single statue of a historical woman. I have long joined committed activists in speaking out against this bronze ceiling, bronze ceiling, and I urge the Public Design Commission to approve the proposal to correct this situation. The monument would honor the women's rights movement with a statue commer commemorating three of the most influential American suffragists, Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony. These three women changed our country through their tireless advocacy for the idea that women should have the right to vote. Few campaigns have had such a profound impact on our nation, and the tireless leaders of that effort to deserve to have a statue in New York's town green, Central Park. I'm fully supportive of the design put forward by New York City Parks and the Stanton and Anthony Statue Fund of the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument by Meredith Bergman and the proposed siding along the literary walk in cent the Central Park Mall to be unveiled on August 26, 2020 in celebration of the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I urge the Public Design Commission to approve this proposal consistent with all applicable rules and regulations. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ellen Chesler, a uh, Columbia University trained historian um, who's written three books and many articles uh, on women's history, but as many of you know, I actually had a day job most of my life, not in academia. Uh, I, 41 years ago, became chief of staff to Carol Bellamy when she was the first woman elected to a city or statewide office in New York. In fact, the first woman who ever received a million votes in America because of the huge nature uh, of the population of, of the city. Um, this was 1977, not 1877, as I like to tell some of my students. Um, the history of women's um, activism in public life is short-lived, and that's one of the many reasons this statue is so important. I'm not gonna read a full statement and repeat all that you've already heard. I would like to uh, place into testimony the support of this statue from my dear friend um, and the most perhaps iconic of contemporary women's activists uh, and women's rights promoters, uh, Gloria Steinem, who makes the point in her testimony that uh, this statue represents happily a real moment of the shared struggle of Stanton, Anthony, and Sojourner Truth to universal adult suffrage, not just the suffrage of women, um, and an end to the uh, heritage of patriarchy and slavery that uh, Europeans had brought to this country. Um, we also want to put into your record uh, support of the statement from uh, an iconic actress who um, promoted women's rights through nine to five and other um, uh, television and uh, film uh, legacies from her career, um, Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner. Uh, and 
I want to say that currently I'm reviewing a book by uh, Ellen Carroll Du Bois, perhaps the most prominent of uh, uh, women's suffrage historians. She's at UCLA. Um, it's a book which I can assure you uh, gives credibility to the idea of placing these three women on this pedestal together in the exquisitely sensitive manner to the complexity of their relationships and to the complexity of race, class, and gender um, that we have to understand the women's suffrage movement within. Um, Ellen is traveling and couldn't be here and, and prepare a, test, a, a statement of her own. I want to end simply by saying that um, in those years, 41 years ago, when I was working here in this very room, um, I was a young mother uh, living on the edge of Central Park. Um, and so like so many of the women who've spoken to you today, I wheeled my baby carriages uh, underneath those statues and well remember my son looking up um, at, at the many men, and, and particularly um, the political men, uh, and being inspired by them, but there was nobody for my young daughter to look at, uh, save for Alice in Wonderland. And I am here after a lifetime of work, um, both locally and internationally, on women's suffrage and a lifetime of scholarship to uh, underscore the importance of building this statue. Thank you very much. Uh, next four speaker. Oh, wait, we have. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is David Spaulding. I'm a member of the board of trustees of the Statue Fund. I'd like to read a letter of support for our statue from Ken Burns of Florentine Films. As you may be aware, Mr. Burns is an American filmmaker and director who is known for using archival footage and photographs to enhance his films with epic historic scope. His most widely known documentary series includes the Civil War, baseball, jazz, the Roosevelt's, and the Vietnam War. Two of Burns' documentaries on iconic New York City structures, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty, have earned Academy Award nominations among his several Emmy Awards. Though his letter was written earlier this year prior to the statue's redesign, which now includes Sojourner Truth, his enthusiastic support is clear. To the Design Commission, I write to wholeheartedly add my voice and support of the Statue Fund's proposal for a new statue in Central Park, celebrating the pioneering suffragists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. As a director and producer of the award-winning documentary For Ourselves Alone, the story of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, I was blessed with the opportunity of getting to know these remarkable women. And I believe they represent the very best of our nation. Their achievements and the fight for women's suffrage that they championed are wholly befitting inclusion in the world-class public forum that is Central Park. Stanton, Stanton and Anthony almost single-handedly created and spearheaded the women's rights movement in the United States. Their cause was virulently opposed by government and religious authority, by the press and popular opinion, by a host of male progressive leaders, and even by women. Still, their stalwart commitment never waned, and in 2020, America will celebrate the centennial of women's enfranchisement. The unveiling of this proposed statue next year will honor all Americans while framing a discussion around the important anniversary. The passing of the 19th Amendment is, after all, representative of the greatest aspect of American democracy, the ability to evolve in order to right a wrong. Women's suffrage is about the very meaning of freedom and independence, and Stanton and Anthony, dedicated, unafraid, and indefatigable emblems of female leadership are evidence of what activism can achieve. They are quite simply two of the most important people in American history. As a filmmaker and as the father of four daughters, I extend my heartfelt support to this initiative. Signed, Ken Burns. Excuse me, are we allowed to ask a question? Uh, can I ask a question? You know, I'm a devotee of Mr. Burns as a documentarian and his place in history. I'm curious, he says in the context of the letter that he got to know these people. Did you mean to say, sir, because this is in public record, that he got to study their work? 
Well, I read what he wrote. Oh. I, I can assume that he got to know them through reading. Okay, good. Uh, we would rather not debate those matters right now. Let's hear all of the public testimony and then we can ask some more questions. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Richard Southwick. I'm a partner at Bayer Blinder Bell. Uh, we've been involved for several years with uh, the Monumental Women uh, program uh, in the capacity of a, uh, the project manager to uh, uh, help achieve this uh, very worthy goal. Um, uh, again, many fewer years than many of the people you've heard from over the last few minutes. Um, we helped to organize the uh, competition uh, we had uh, uh, close to 100 uh, uh, um, submissions in that competition, and uh, we're very pleased to have selected uh, a very talented sculptor uh, uh, by the name of Meredith uh, Bergman. I give uh, Meredith a lot of credit for what she's achieved, uh, particularly in her adjusting the design very quickly and very competently as the program has been revised. Um, my main concern why I speak to you today is one of schedule. Um, the process is uh, a public process and we're all used to that. We're going through it step by step, um, but we are really down to the wire in terms of meeting uh, the one date that can change, which is uh, August 26, uh, 2020. Uh, we have a real challenge to meet that. Uh, we believe we can, but the uh, the uh, a casting process has to start this December, and there are many steps to get to that. Um, we are ready to start the structural engineering. We're ready to do a lot of the support work, but we need a design approved. Um, uh, I'll leave, keep this very brief. I just urge the PDC uh, to consider all these points very carefully today and uh, vote in the affirmative today so we can move on with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Madison Marlowe and I work for Manhattan Borough President Gail A. Brewer and I am here to read a letter of support from the 106th Mayor of New York City, David N. Dinkins. The word representation can be overly activated, but that does not diminish its truth and its importance. When the citizens of NYC elected me as their 106th Mayor in 1989, they changed history and we broke barriers. My election brought representation for African American men and women into City Hall in Gracie Mansion as a person who looked like them and rose up from meager means into the executive office of the most powerful city in the world. It is important for children to see people that look like them. This fact is widely known and accepted. And yet, I have learned that there is an active debate currently taking place around the value of dedicating a statue in Central Park that depicts three iconic women, all leaders in the battle for women's rights. The controversy centers around the inclusion of the African-American hero, Sojourner Truth, among the three. As I understand it, this monument was already approved by the city and the Department of NYC Parks years ago. That there are currently no statues of female historical figures installed within the vast acreage of Central Park and fewer than 10 compared to the volumes of statues of men throughout the city is a sad truth. Therefore, depicting Sojourner Truth among the monument proposed in Central Park seems a just cause in the long road to correcting not only the lacking depiction, but the, also the rightful place that African-American women held within the women's suffrage movement, a position that is often overlooked and underweighted. The monument, as proposed, is, is a just beginning toward representational balance in every way. This installation has been a long time in coming, and both the Monumental Women Fund and the Girl Scouts organization have fought valiantly for this statue. Think of all the girls who walk through that park every day, and then think of the girls and women of color who walk through the park every day. 
Why is this issue still under debate, debate and considered controversial when it has already passed all the tests of historical relevance and been given a green light? With the centennial of the 19th Amendment ratification approaching its national celebration in NYC in less than one year, the window is closing for successful completion of this important project. New York City will attract large crowds of patriotic women, men, girls, and boys from all over the country. The statue of the women's rights pioneers should be approved as presented to you today in order to meet the timeline for completion in time for this celebration. It should not be held up any longer. There are generations of young women counting on this important project moving forward so that they may see themselves represented as they stroll through Central Park. NYC has always been a leader among cities. I ask that you approve this historic representational monument and maintain our leadership status on this issue. Sincerely, David Dinkins. Thank you very much. Does that conclude the testimony? Um, all right, uh, we'd like to hear now from various commissioners. Uh, after that, we will uh, deliberate and uh, take a vote. Who cares to speak first? I have an awkward time seeing you, just want it's not our usual arrangement, so I know you have things to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the testimony. It was really wonderful to hear about the support from so many different um, organizations and perspectives. Um, I have to say that I personally am in agreement with wanting to find representation, uh, want, wanting to you know, make, make, make progress on this issue, on, on building out the monuments of women in New York City. I actually found very little to disagree with in terms of the testimonies. Um, the overarching concept of what we're trying to achieve um, in terms of advancing representation of women is, um, you know, I, I think that I have very strong agreement with. Um, we, we had also talked in previous times about just, you know, our purview really, which is the aesthetics of the statue itself. And we very much appreciate the response of the artist in engaging in these conversations. But I think that's really um, what's, at, what's in debate here. It's not the women that are represented. It's not um, you know, the purpose of doing it. It's, it really is you know, what are we really looking at um, because it is such a monumental project um, and the context is very significant. Um, so I, I, I'm not um, an artist, so I'm going to leave some, those comments and details to uh, my fellow commissioners, but I wanted to say that in terms of the general um, purpose and reason for you know, supporting the testimonies were, were wonderful, and we, you know, I agree with very much of what you've said, and I think really the question is the aesthetics of the statue at this stage. And, I also did appreciate the comments about the process, and um, you know, I, I think that's extremely important um, for us to take into consideration. Um, good morning. Um, uh, I concur with my colleague as well to um, always be in support of more women being represented in the public sphere and, of course, to support uh, the, the next generation of artists and um, women of color, and specifically this uh, historical monumenting of uh, that movement. Um, I concur as well that it is not really that the general concept that is in question, but um, we have made suggestions or comments to the design, to the, to the artists and the fund um, to consider having uh, historians uh, view and make comments con uh, with the actual proposal on hand to, so that they can respond to the way that the uh, people are being positioned, the aesthetics of it, and how um, it will be read or seen um, 
not just for the people making the work, but for, for the larger community of New York and also um, future generations of women. Um, and so that it, uh, it is more historically accurate and also um, has a, a more diverse sensibility. So that, those are points that were offered in comments um, and have been offered previously, which um, I don't think were um, put on um, public, for public review. Thank you. Me? Yes, you, Hank. Oh, man. Um, well, I, first of all, it's really um, amazing to sit here in front of all of you, and I can imagine all of you have other things that you might like to do on a warm Monday morning and um, really understand and appreciate how important this is to everyone who's taken the time to attend and all the incredible support that was garnered alongside uh, um, the, the fund and Monumental Women to, you know, this is going to happen. And I think it's really important that this statue uh, and statues like these um, are realized. I also have to uh, take a moment to acknowledge that, you know, there are many uh, women who spoke this morning who I hope someday will be honored in a, in a statue uh, by the city and by the country. There are some things that I have to say that are more challenging. I have great respect, admiration, um, and appreciation for uh, the artist as well as um, kind of all of the work that you've done um, to respond to things in rap. You've kind of been a superhero as far as your willingness to dig deep and try to alter things and respond to feedback. And I think you are in a very challenging situation, so I have a lot of empathy. However, my, my bigger sh challenge is with this idea that we need to uh, rush to a deadline to honor the legacy of women in our country. I think we all know what happens when we rush um, to make something happen, especially a creative thing. Um, I've, I've done that, I kind of do it for a living and often have had a lot of regrets around that. And the biggest reason that we should not be rushing, although I do think this needs to happen to make a specific deadline, um, is because we, there are, what, I think five or six other um, statues there that I think could easily be replaced by an individual statue to each of these women. And I don't think that there will be many people who will miss the Burns statue, or some people might not miss the Columbus statue, since there's another one just a few hundred yards. Um, and so, when we when we're choosing to say there's 10 statues of women in in this in this city and we're going to make an 11th that actually honors three and it's like a three for one thing I think is incredibly problematic if we really want to be making a bold statement in the 21st century um, I I would love for there to be some kind of acknowledgement of the failure of all of us to be able to really live up to what this moment should suggest if we want to um, kind of put, the, put a Band-Aid on something so important. And I can say, com in comparison to the Boston Women's Memorial, I think this is, it's, you know, it's just not right. You know, and, I, and, I, and I say that, saying that I, this is the same artist whose work I came across beforehand, and I really I actually took as inspiration for a, a project that I'm doing in Boston um, because it broke the mold, and to say that we want to fit into the symmetry of a patriarchal system based on writers, you know, to give them this little plot on the corner, it's like, come on, we can do better than that, you know, especially this artist can do better and has done better than that. Um, and then to say, and then these, these, these women are incredible um, historical figures, um, but this is literary row, and that kind of dishonors their, their, their role in society and also 19th century authors many of them who are not considered in this position. Um, so I'm, I'm stuck because I'm like, I really want to be supportive because I, I, I feel indebted in a lot of ways, but I'm also nervous about us approving something that's going to stand for another century or two, and then people, we know who was elected after David Dinkins and what happened. Um, and so oftentimes when we make progress, Barack Obama, um, there's um, huge, um, 
ways in which people kind of overlook the progress and say we don't have to do more. So that's, those are, those are the, the areas in which I'm struggling to negotiate and wish that there was a kind of greater kind of consideration of what this really could be if we really want to make, um, be the city uh, that does something incredible um, in honor of these monumental women. Thank you, Hank. Uh, yes, Ethel. <clears throat> First, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say that um, it's extremely heartwarming and more than that, very impressive to have been witness to the clear statements, the outpouring and the advocacy of so many women of my own generation and younger and to be able to hear this and to be part in a small way of this extremely important movement. I just have two points which I think echo those of my fellow commissioners. First, um, I, uh, at uh, earlier meetings, I think uh, the artists and uh, sculptors and others on the commission to whom I defer in many ways in terms of their comments uh, did offer a number of uh, comments and suggestions uh, to the artist whom I also want to say um, I respect a great deal and from a distance have admired enormously her sculpture in Boston uh, of the women there. It's, it's, it's truly extraordinary and beautiful. But um, there are a number of comments that have been made, important ones within the purview of the commission and it would be important for all of us to hear the response from the artist and others to those comments. Secondly, and for me, having been for a long time schooled in the importance of public process and from many different groups, I think it, it, we have not heard, uh, as I think we should, uh, from the community boards, from others of the public, uh, to, uh, in response to comments made by the PDC, and for others appropriately that they should have the time uh, to, that we should all hear and for them to deliberate. So I think these are important considerations as we work on this today. Thank you, Ethel. Yes. Okay. Um, I concur with my colleagues and I also want to thank you all for the amount of work that you that went into preparing for today and all of the um, testimonies that were made and I am in agreement with almost all of it but um, I, I agree with Ethel that um, we prob I would suggest that we uh, table the project subject to a resubmission to community board review which is part of our process and I think the public since this is the first public viewing of the piece here, I think we need to give the public an opportunity to respond and to go through that process that is part of our city. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. I want to say that the uh, give and take from the beginning of this process, I think, has been an extraordinary display of civic engagement. I want to congratulate the people on the commission and the staff for working this through. But in the course of public discourse, there becomes moments of inflection at which you either go forward or you get trapped. I worry, I really worry that as this goes forward, and I, I understand the need to obviously bring this to the community boards and finish the public discourse, then we've got to make a decision. I do not want to make perfect the enemy of the good here. I think the intentions here are extraordinary. At the beginning of this project, there was one woman standing alone. The artist listened. And this project grew, I think, historically, significantly, and based on I think great input. I personally want to thank the people on the commission 
this public design commission who helped bring that along, I would never have been able to make the comments that you were able to make Mary or that you were able to make Hank simply because my eye isn't attuned to it. But my ears aren't attuned to public discourse. And we are coming to a point where I think we have to figure out how to move this forward and not get trapped in um, things that are just not going to be helpful to get these women up, recognized, and their historical significance applauded. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll play <clears throat> clean up batter here. Excuse me. Yes. Appreciate that, yes, thank you. Um, so I concur with my fellow commissioners. We thank you all for taking the time uh, to make your uh, very powerful uh, arguments, which I think um, Commissioner Tisch has uh, articulated. Um, I will just join some of the other commissioners in saying that speaking personally, um, I am in complete support um, of the concept and initiative of this um, a statue to monumental women. Uh, it's certainly been my uh, life goal to uh, defend that. However, there are some matters of process that are integral to our commission um, that, uh, and uh, some aesthetic concerns that um, have not uh, yet been addressed. And uh, so one of those is we are in need of those letters from the various community boards in order for us to make a positive vote. Um, secondly, and we have asked this before, uh, we, we do need the uh, independent uh, opinions of historians as to the accuracy of the way in which these women are depicted. We've asked for that now consistently for a number of months. Uh, and then thirdly, we have made some specific aesthetic comments, uh, which I won't um, waste people's time, but it is uh, a matter of record and, and it is known by um, the artist. So uh, I think that it is, uh, we do not want to delay this any further. Uh, we do have to point out to members of the public that um, there have been several changes along the way here, not requested specifically by our commission, that has been part of the reason for some of the delay. So uh, our, uh, we would like uh, very much to support this um, uh, project. Uh, we are in uh, requirement of a few items, uh, and so I would like to put before our commissioners uh, a vote to table this project. Uh, if er everything is resolved over the course of the next month, we would put it on the consent agenda for approval. Well, first, so, so moved, who's moved? Yeah. A motion to table. Uh, a second? No, that's not the way our process works. Um, and uh, those in favor of tabling this proposal with an intent to move forward as quickly as possible, please raise your right hand. That is a unanimous vote. Thank you. 
Um, we will, uh, I believe, now take a 10-minute break um, before the next uh, public item. Move, moving on to the last public hearing item, item number 27207, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. As a reminder, the applicant will present their proposal, and then we will hear testimony. Afterwards, the committee will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. If you would like to give testimony on this uh, item, please sign up right outside the chamber if you haven't already done so. Names will be called in the order to which they are listed on the sheet. time today. I would also like to recognize the community members, advocates, and elected officials, many of whom are here today, whose committed input has helped us tailor our design efforts to the community's needs as we seek to provide urgently needed flood protection to this diverse community of Manhattan's Lower East Side. We are presenting for preliminary review a plan very similar to what the Commission approved at a conceptual level last April. We have further developed the project's key design, the, the key design elements, incorporating the Commission's feedback as well as input that we've received from the community. Since the, design, since the updated design approach was announced last, last fall, we've had robust continual engagement with over 60 meetings with community members, community board organizations, elected officials, and other stakeholders. This dialogue has deeply informed important com in components of the project design, such as the storm barriers, bridges, DEP facilities, the amphitheater, and other parks amenities. Additionally, at, as part of the year alert, we've shared this design with both affected community boards and Manhattan Borough Board, and are pleased to report that all three bodies have approved this proposal as we are working to address their conditions. As we shared with the design, Commission in January, the current design improves the park's overall resiliency and approves and provides enhanced neighborhood connectivity and integration, waterfront access, quality open space with improved amenities, as well as passive and active recreational spaces that will improve the quality of life for community and for our city for generations to come. Furthermore, in addition to significantly improving underground water and drainage infrastructure, this design incorporates a flood protection strategy that includes elevating portions of the park to meet FEMA 100-year design, design flood elevation in lieu of the previously proposed mile-long flood wall. This has allowed us to address the Commission's concerns in regards to the significant visual obstruction that the previously exposed flood wall would have posed on the neighborhood's residents as well as negative streetscape land impacts. Lastly, in response to the Commission's feedback, we are in the process of engaging an environmental graphics and wayfinding consultant with the goal of further integrating this new infrastructure into the neighborhood and educate the public about the important features of this infrastructure. We look forward to submitting the project's signage design to you in the upcoming months. With that, I would like to introduce our design team consultants, consultant members who will present the updated design components. Maggie Hopkins from AKRF, Matt Stout from One Architecture, Will Hart from MNLA, and Autumn Visconti from Big. Thanks. So as you're all aware, this project is on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, ranging from Montgomery Street in the south to East 25th Street in the north. And the primary focus of our discussion today will be on East River Park, which is a low-lying park today and is vulnerable not only to flooding from coastal storm surge, but also to daily tidal inundation as sea levels rise. And so this project takes advantage of the flood protection as an opportunity to raise the entire park out of the floodplain, making a more resilient park and reconstructing the esplanade as well. And most importantly, the project includes the opportunity to raise the park further and raise the flood protection further 
uh, an additional two feet so that we can adapt as the climate changes and sea levels continue to rise. And Matt will talk about what that flood protection will look like. The flood protection system is comprised of three basic components. The first being uh, a raised landscape that Maggie just described, which you can see the elevated park and the dashed line of the flood protection underneath. The second is uh, an exposed flood wall that you see with uh, the black line on the page. And the third are closure gates indicated by these dots uh, that are used at roadway crossings and key waterfront access points. Uh, to further to the north in Project Area 2, where space is more constrained, the system will be walls and several gates in order to maintain connectivity to the waterfront and uh, open circulation. <clears throat> um, in East River Park, approximately 50% of the edge along the highway will remain as existing, which is an uh, existing concrete barrier with a park's fence on top. Uh, the remaining 50% will be reconstructed as either a flood wall or a retaining wall with the park, and a park-style fence will be constructed on top. In Project Area 2, we will not have a fence on top of the wall. Uh, here you can see the graphics of how the flood protection navigates through several geographies, Murphy Brothers Playground, Stuyvesant Cove Park, uh, and Astor Levy Recreation Center. Uh, the flood wall itself in those different geographies uh, changes to adapt to different physical conditions. Uh, most notably, when the wall is along the highway, it will have an integrated traffic barrier profiles to eliminate the need for any double wall. At House and, Suite, House and Street, however, we will be constructing a uh, separate retaining wall behind the existing off-ramp structure. As I noted before, when we're building a new flood wall or uh, retaining wall along the highway edge, uh, we will be uh, installing a new fence that is an extension of the current parks design standard fence. You can see an image of that on the right. That's the existing conditions of the existing barrier in the fence. And on the left is an adaptation of that design ad adapted to meet uh, current DOT safety requirements, namely uh, eight feet high protection height from the park side, and then in high locations in the park, a one inch uh, mesh attached to the back side of the fence. Here's a view of, of that wall looking from the south uh, near Corlears Hook Bridge. You can see the wall in this case is stepping down along to follow uh, landscape as it's dropping to meet uh, existing grade and the, the fence on top. For the flood wall relief uh, design, uh, it's our intent to express every foot of the vertical elevation of the flood wall itself through a, a banded uh, pattern. This banded pattern uh, is variable and can stretch and compress uh, depending on and reacting to the various conditions that it's, that it's within. And we are proposing to deboss elevation markers at key locations in the park and, and entry points into the, into the project. And as you can see here, the concept is to uh, use more uh, compressed pattern and more pedestrian, uh, more intimate spaces, and to have a more elongated pattern along the highway in spaces where you actually experience a wall both further away and also at higher speeds. This shows how uh, we will be transitioning from one condition to another. We will have transition panels in order to have smooth movement from, let's say, a uh, compressed condition to an elongated condition. Here's a view in uh, Stuyvesant Cove Park. Uh, looking to the north along the bike lane, you can see the flood wall finish just discussed to the right side and the 20th Street gate uh, beyond. This is, a more closer, this is a closer view looking at the 20th Street gate, looking toward the water about to enter Stuyvesant Cove Park. You can see the flood wall finish pattern and the elevation markers proposed. And I'll talk a, a bit about uh, floodgates. We have 18 floodgates within the project area. We have um, 11 swing gates and seven roller gates. This is an example of one of the swing gates, which is at the southern end of the project as you're entering East River Park uh, right across this, from Pier 42. This is in the open position. This is the gate in the closed position. And the proposed design for the gates themselves are uh, gray painted steel, with uh, rounded corners that uh, work with the overall rounded corner approach that we're treating with, uh, with the flood wall ends. Then we're proposing to extend the banded ap approach by etching a pattern into the face of the flood wall itself and incorporate uh, gate numbering in this elevation as well. And we're looking forward to working with uh, graphic designers as we move forward with this. And also note that we will are proposing to store 
uh, highway signage on top of the gate in order to avoid visible uh, signage when the gate is uh, in the open position. And with that, I'll pass it to Will to talk about the landscape design. So the existing East River Park largely consists of a mix of active and passive recreation. It is physically separated from the community by the FDR and a series of pedestrian bridges and connections provide access over the FDR into the park. Uh, we are working to preserve that mix of active and passive recreation. We've heard from the community that the sports fields and the program is very important to them, as well as kind of the passive spaces as well. And we're also working to improve and uh, enhance those existing and reconstruct new pedestrian bridges in a number of places to provide better access to the park. The landscape concept draws on a range of planting, woodland edges, pastoral openings, layered groves, and maritime edges. At the FDR edge, we have these woodland edges to provide buffer and screening from the roadway views, pastoral openings that respond to lawns and open fields, layered groves that provide and mark entrance points with a little additional uh, <coughs> aesthetic appearance, and then maritime edges that respond to the water's edge and the waterfront nature of this landscape. So then diving in a little more closely, we see the existing conditions of uh, the southern portion of our park uh, and the tie-in connection along Montgomery Street. The proposed connections have our tie-in running along Montgomery Street at Governor's Gardens, uh, and then flood protection continuing along the west side of Pier 42 project before it then moves into the park as Matt described previously. Looking at this connection, uh, in this instance, we've peeled off the top of the FDR. We're showing the flood wall rising up Montgomery Street and tapering into grade. There you see the roller gate, which will cross South Street in the open position, uh, and then a swing gate farther up on the FDR ramp, the northbound side. Taking a look at this from street level, we see the existing conditions today in Governor's Gardens in the background. Uh, we see the proposed flood protection with the patterning and banding and then the tying into the higher ground on the left and then the gate in the open pocket in the open position on the right. And then here we see the gate sliding shut when it's deployed for a storm event. Moving then farther into the park, we are coordinating closely with the work at Pier 42, which is a separate project, uh, working to maintain the active, active access to the ferry landing, uh, reconfiguring the amphitheater to respond to the new grading in that location, as well as the replacement of the Corlears Hook Bridge. Here, moving farther up, we see that existing amphitheater a little more closely. And then a mix of active and passive recreation in the Delancey Street area with fields one and two, a multi-use turf field, open lawns, and sports courts. The proposed design replaces that amphitheater with a uh, kind of a mix of active and pa passive use that can provide day-to-day -day use and then also the active events. We have a new bridge at Corlears Hook Park connecting across the FDR maintaining active recreation with fields one and two and sports courts, as well as creating a family-friendly zone with passive lawns, barbecue, uh, and a nature exploration area in this part of the park, as well as also a new bridge at Delancey Street. Here you see an aerial view of that space. Uh, the embayment in this location is uh, replacing an existing embayment that's farther north in the park, and it steps down to provide access closer to the water. Uh, uh, preserving the fire boathouse existing in kind, and then again that family-friendly area with open lawns, barbecue, and sports courts uh, just south of the Williamsburg Bridge. Okay. Thanks, Will. Here we're looking at the existing Corlears Hook Bridge. Um, it currently has a low overhead clearance over the FDR Highway, and with the proposed Corlears Hook Bridge, we are lifting the bridge in order to meet the new high grade of the reconstructed amphitheater. This is the first of the three reconstructed pedestrian bridges. We're utilizing uh, multiple de design details within a tide arch structural system in order to maintain consistency in design. The tide arch bridge system is also the lightest and promotes the most transparency and safety for park users in the park. This is looking on the bridge uh, towards Corlears Hook Park. Here you can see a seamless transition uh, using soft curves to, to create a welcoming and inviting um, 
uh, user interface for park users as they enter the park. This is an aerial overview of Corlears Hook Bridge, connecting both Corlears Hook Park and East River uh, Amphitheater. Uh, again, uh, using the a sweeping design geometry that kind of plays into the overall design language of the park uh, in the bridge arch structure itself. This is a detailed layout of the bridge structural components as they relate to the overall span and width of the bridge. The span and the width are the, to be the same of, as of the existing Corlears Hook Bridge today. Looking a little bit deeper, uh, here's a detailed sections of the transition from the bridge arch itself to the adjacent guardrails. Uh, looking through a section of the bridge deck where we are currently orienting the bridge arcs to be 90 degree perpendicular to the bridge deck itself. Uh, we're making this change in order to accommodate the uh, light poles on the bridge deck. And along the bottom, you can see the sweeping geometry of the bridge arch as it connects to the two graceful landings on both park sides. The overall material palette for the bridges uh, include a painted steel, which will be a light gray. Uh, the bridge abutments will utilize a similar concrete relief pattern that's used in the flood wall. And we're also using the PDC Billings Jackson details for our guardrails. Moving back into East River Park, this is an enlarged plan for the proposed reconstructed amphitheater, uh, also sh highlighting a stage area uh, just adjacent to a step-down embayment, which is south of fields one and two. This is an aerial view of that same area, uh, showing the relationship of the reconstructed amphitheater in between the Corlears Hook Bridge and the new Esplanade step-down embayment, which will draw users down to the, to the waterfront. Moving a little further north of fields one and two is the Delancey Street area. Here we're introducing a Delancey Great Lawn, which is framed by a nature exploration zone, as well as a, a barbecue area. Um, closer to the FDR Drive is a maintenance and operations facility. Uh, there are one, um, this is one of three facilities throughout the park. Um, each facility varies in size, but o overall they, they include structures that include a prefabricated bridge, or I'm sorry, prefabricated uh, shed structure, a stainless steel canopy structure, and electric uh, vehicle charging station. The material palette for these areas include a, um, a screening fence, the prefab uh, concrete buildings with the same finish pattern as the flood wall, uh, and a steel canopy with integrated PV uh, vault uh, arrays. Moving closer to the Esplanade, uh, here you can see the fireboat house, which will remain, and adjacent to that is the nature exploration zone. And between the two, they're framed by planting and uh, seating and umbrellas uh, to help promote uh, the much needed shade for this area. Today, uh, this is looking towards the park from the city side, and you can see the fireboat house in the distance. And in the foreground, you can see the Delancey Street Bridge with its steep switchbacks, which are completely um, unsafe and not ADA compliant. Acting as a new gateway into the park, the proposed Delancey Street Bridge opens out onto the, the Great Lawn in front of the Delancey Street um, Bridge connection uh, with a quick little shortcut down the, down the stairs towards the Delancey Street basketball courts. The Delancey Street Bridge also acts within the family of the three bridges, utilizing the um, design consistency in, in transition details, as well as the softness and geometries for all of our structural components. Kind of a planned view of the bridge span and length. Here we, can, we are highlighting diagrammatically how users can easily uh, cross the Delancey Street Bridge and join the uh, Manhattan Greenway as it runs north and south in the park. Zooming in on the similar details for this bridge, uh, we are using the exact same details for consistency as, as I described for the Corlears Hook Bridge. Uh, the arches are a little bit taller for this bridge um, it, as it is, does have a longer span. Um, again, highlighting the, the seamless transition between uh, the bridge arch interface as well as the uh, handrail connection. Moving down towards a city side approach to this bridge, we have a wide enough path which is going to be maintained at 12 feet across the bridge ramp and across the bridge deck itself. 
also inter integrated into the Delancey Street sidewalk area, which ha has room for about five feet. Moving further along and onto the bridge, here we are showing users as they cross over FDR uh, with a consistent 12 foot wide uh, bridge deck and pathway as um, views are framed as you enter the park. I'll hand it back to Will to walk you through the north. So the existing landscape at Houston Street area includes again a mix of active and passive recreation. That includes 12 tennis courts. Uh, it also includes the two embayments, one of which you've seen relocated to the south near the amphitheater. Uh, the second embayment you see uh, remaining in this general location, although being more closely tied to what is a broad kind of open welcoming lawn at Houston Street at the point of arrival. We are again including those 12 tennis courts, which are so important to the community, as well as a new tennis house and a plaza. We have step down areas that lead, uh, have kind of a two tiers that get people closer to the water, both at the tennis house, uh, kind of all along the esplanade there, uh, and then also at the embayment. Uh, and we've done this by maintaining those active fields, but pulling them apart and providing a much more gracious entry into the park, into a park landscape. So here you get an overview of that kind of aerial. You see the 12 courts, the step down at the tennis uh, uh, courts along the esplanade, uh, fields three and four pulling apart, and then that welcoming open lawn at Houston Street at the point of arrival, and also the step down embayment. Here is currently the view of arrival as you come into the park from Houston Street. You're greeted with a railing, and then you descend either side on a ramp down to uh, existing grade where you travel along a fenced fields. The proposed design raises up that elevation of the park and provides a more gracious and seamless connection into the park at grade, so you'll have a direct connection to the water through a passive area. Uh, and you see that in this view looking back to the park. You see the elevated landscape which people arrive in, the direct connection to the waterfront, the embayment associated with that passive lawn, and the step down towards the water's edge. Moving farther to the north, we see the existing track and field house, field seven and eight, which are slightly undersized, uh, the existing playground, a barbecue area, and the basketball courts. The proposed design maintains and enhances that field, uh, the track and field, by raising it up, creates a new track and field building with new amenities, uh, maintains a field in this location, field seven, which is slightly larger than the previous two combined, uh, as well as includes uh, playgrounds for ages 2 to 5 and 5 to 12, a barbecue area, and junior basketball courts. Here's a view of that looking back. Again, we have zones for barbecue and a family-friendly area at the north with the playground and the courts. Uh, field 7, which is a natural turf field, the reconstructed track and field, the existing 6th Street Bridge, which will remain, and then a new reconstructed 10th Street Bridge. Here you see that 10th Street Bridge in existing condition crossing over the FDR and then switch back ramps leading down to existing grade. The proposed bridge builds upon the design vocabulary that Autumn mentioned with the tied arches. It has generous 12 foot wide ramps that have slopes of one to 20, so they're universally accessible with a kind of a uh, bit of an easier set of stairs at the end of the ramps if you're looking for a more direct approach. Here you see how bicyclists and uh, users of the Manhattan Greenway would enter the park along that ramp, cross over, and then be able to connect to the north and the south to the Greenway. These are the technical drawings speaking to kind of the details that I just mentioned, the 12 foot width and the 5% slopes as well as the details of those arches, the profiles, and the design vocabulary from the bridges that we've seen. Uh, this is a view of that point of arrival from 10th Street. You see this broad welcoming opening stair leading people up with an, a broad ramp just to the right of that leading into the park as well. Arrival in the park then, we've been able to eliminate those switchback ramps by raising up the grade and arriving in the landscape with direct connections to the waterfront and park uses. Here you see the bridge connecting in, the new uh, playground with uh, play features for ages 2 to 5 and 5 to 12, as well as a new comfort station and basketball courts to the north. 
Uh, the materials palette within East River Park draws upon park standard materials, so we're using full depth asphalt pavement for the bikeway, uh, exposed aggregate pathways for the pathways that are on grade, and concrete unit pavers for uh, pathways that are over the esplanade structure itself. Uh, in our maintenance areas, we have cement concrete, and in our nature exploration area, we have some wood chip kind of material as well as accessible paths integrated for other users. Uh, within the park, I've mentioned some of the embayments and the step-downs. The step-down material itself is precast concrete, uh, so those will be modular units that step down and provide seating opportunities. Uh, we're using a bit of landscape stone uh, to help maintain and transition some of the grade and slopes within the park itself. And we have generally minimized concrete and other elements, but we do have a bit of concrete for uh, walls for sports courts, uh, a step here and there. I think we have one at um, Corleus Hook Park, uh, and then curbs to help maintain the edges of pavements. Uh, the color palette draws in a bright kind of beachy theme with uh, utilizing park standard safety surfaces as well as uh, a sand color for this kind of connection to the waterfront. Uh, and then sports courts that are also kind of bright and colorful as well. Uh, drawing also on park standard pallets are uh, chain link fencing for to enclose our fields, uh, plant railing fencing in areas where we expect some high traffic uh, potentially through planted areas, uh, pipe handrails, and uh, park standard uh, sea rail along the waterfront and esplanade edge. The seating and kind of furnishing pallet draws again on park standard pallet with the uh, standard world fair bench in back to backless forms. Uh, dugout benches are that standard type C bench that you see in the middle. Uh, the picnic tables are utilizing the longer picnic tables we have here, along with some carousel seating integrated into the esplanade and other gathering areas. Uh, the amenities across the bottom are drawing again on kind of park standards with misters and other elements spaced appropriately for the uses throughout the park. We're supplementing this palette with a, uh, a World's Fair bar stool to allow abusers uh, users the opportunity to see up and over the rail along the esplanade edge, uh, as well as a lower height version of that to provide equal opportunities with companion seatings for users with disabilities. Uh, we are supplementing also kind of the lounge opportunity with the change lounge along the waterfront edge that you see kind of becoming more and more common in our waterfront parks, as well as umbrellas for shade that are integrated both freestanding and with tables. The lighting palette largely draws upon the New York City Department of Transportation and Park's standard lighting features. Uh, within East River Park, the Flushing Meadow Poles is uh, the predominant pole kind of on the upland side, whereas the uh, solar pole, the Evergen M series, is used along the Esplanade edge where solar conditions will allow it to have sufficient light to uh, work and function properly throughout the year. As we move north to the north end of the project, the flyover bridge uh, is fully funded. It is not being built as part of this project, but we are working to integrate the design and planning of it into the design of East River Park to ensure that we minimize any disruptions to our completed work in the future. Here you can see it roughly beginning at the north end of East River Park, moving up and over, over the Con Ed screening facility, and then tying back down along the Captain Patrick J. Brown walkway. Here is a view showing how we would integrate it in the near term with the pathway sloping back down to existing grade and a retaining wall holding up the sports courts. And then in the future, you see that the uh, sports courts remain, the flyover bridge connects to that elevated portion and seamlessly connects to the existing park. Again, showing that alignment rising up from the north end of the park, up and over the Con Ed screening facility and along the FDR and then tying back down to the walkway to the north. Okay. Moving then to the north, we see just the tip of East River Park and Murphy's Brothers Park and Playground uh, in, on the north end of this, along with Con Ed facilities in this area. In this location, the flood protection passes over the FDR and largely runs along the west side of the FDR uh, and then the east side of Murphy's Brothers Playground. And here you see that condition as it's moving along uh, the Con Ed building and the Con Ed parking lot, and then Murphy's Brothers and Stuyco Park in the distance. 
Again, the existing conditions for Murphy's Brothers Playground consists of a small sports field that is used for t-ball and playgrounds and courts, where Stuyvesant Cove Park is more tied to the programming of Solar One with native plants and passive recreation. The proposed design seeks to uh, replace these active programs uh, in Murphy's Brothers Playground with two t-ball fields, uh, basketball courts, and playgrounds for ages two to five and five to 12. Uh, in Stuyvesant Cove Park, we're working with the uh, Solar One to maintain the diverse native plantings, but also to include plantings that respond to uh, uh, resiliency and potential erosion in a storm event. Here you see the elevator park with the flood protection running along the west side, uh, the Manhattan Greenway just to the west of the flood protection, and th the sloping park tapering back down to the esplanade. Here's an aerial view showing those conditions, looking back with Murphy's Brothers in the T-ball fields, the existing 20th Street Ferry to remain, and Stuyvesant Cove Park with Solar One and Astor Levy at the top. Zooming in, you see the T-ball fields at Murphy's Brothers Playground, the flood protection running along the east side of Murphy's Brothers Playground, crossing under the FDR into Stuyvesant Cove Park, where the Manhattan Greenway runs along the west side, the flood protection uh, then holds the slopes for Stuyvesant Cove Park that taper down into the Esplanade. Here's a view again of uh, Murphy's Brothers Playground, uh, a little closer view. And then moving north, we see the north half of Stuyvesant Cove Park with a pedestrian gate, uh, a roller gate across East 20th Street, uh, the future Solar One Environmental Education Building there, and then a vehicle vehicular swing gate as we move north toward the BP station. Here's a view looking south to north. Again, we see uh, the bikeway to the west of the flood protection, uh, the planted slopes of uh, Stuyvesant Cove Park with seating and the existing ferry, uh, and then the 20th Street opening uh, kind of in the middle of the screen, the Solar One building to the north. Here's a view looking at that 20th Street crossing. In all these crossings to Stuyvesant Cove Park, we've tried to make them as generous as possible with the engineering constraints working within, uh, providing green and welcoming entrances that are broad. Uh, in this instance, you see the gate in a pocket on the right in its open position. Uh, and to the top of the screen, you see the proposed interceptor gate, which Matt will speak about in a moment. Here's a view from the south, looking back towards that gate. You see the gate just off to the right in its open position. Switching angles, you looking from the north to the south, you see that gate in its open position uh, with the opening at 20th Street. And then again, signaling this moment of arrival with the elevation markers integrated into the wall, the green peering through the opening and signaling the entrance to the park. Then moving farther north, we have uh, the tail end of Stuyvesant Cove Park, uh, the BP gas station, the elevated FDR, and then the existing Astor Levy playground, which includes mostly a mix of active recreation. So here you see the flood protection moving along and under the FDR, crossing over uh, with a number of gates, running along the east edge of Astor Levy Recreation Center in the elevated pool. And then moving along what is today a fence line that separates the small maintenance area from the existing act, uh, active recreation spaces of Astor Le Levy Park. Uh, a large roller gate will provide an opening that connects the two halves of Astor Levy. The existing track and handball courts will remain. New basketball courts and playground areas will be reincorporated. Here you see a view of that with the gate just at the bottom of the screen the flood protection moving along and enclosing that maintenance area, and then tying into the VA center uh, in the middle of the screen with the flood protection and the gate in the open position. Okay. The flood protection in this area will change tone slightly, it drawing on the limestone color of the building and the, um, uh, the finishing of the building uh, the cornice. Uh, and here we see the gate in the open position and the opening connecting to the south side of Astor Levy Recreation Center. Okay. 
So the project will have uh, two interceptor gate buildings, uh, one on the north end of the project and one on the south end of the project. Um, the purpose of these buildings is to house the necessary equipment uh, to maintain and operate uh, two underground interceptor sewer gates uh, that must be closed in order to close off the flood protection compartment. What we're looking at here is the plan for the southern location. It is within the DOT right-of-way between the FDR and Corillers Hook Park. You can see to the right the dashed line below is the actual interceptor chamber itself with the building uh, located in close proximity to that. Uh, the building is 64 feet long by 10 and a half feet wide. Here's the elevation of the building. It has a, uh, let's say, a double sloped roof with uh, approximately nine feet high at the lowest end and 13 and a half feet high at the, at the highest end. <clears throat> we are cladding the roof with, uh, with flat lock uh, zinc plated uh, tiles. We are both, or all of the walls will be a solid glass brick cavity wall with uh, the backup wall having uh, clear story, story openings to provide uh, translucency and transparency into the building itself. We are also including a granite base which will match the granite um, uh, within the, the paving <coughs> granite within the area in order to uh, protect the bottom of the building. Here you can see the aerial uh, of that uh, with FDR in the foreground and uh, Coilers Hook uh, Park uh, beyond and the zinc panels on the roof with uh, glass brick wrapping around on all four sides. And I'll note that the, the zinc panels uh, will patina over time and also have a natural uh, variation from panel to panel, so we're expecting to get uh, subtle variation from, from one moment to the next. And here's a, uh, a view from the FDR at, uh, um, during uh, sunset, uh, again looking to achieve a kind of translucency and transparency uh, sort of depth to the structure that uh, would not otherwise exist in a windowless structure. Moving on to the northern uh, interceptor uh, gate building, which is, as noted, located in 20th Street median, uh, adjacent to Stuyvesant Cove Park. As you can see from the plan, the median will be widened to accommodate uh, the same size uh, building. And uh, this building will also have the same uh, massing and as well as the same material palette as the south building. And here's an aerial image again, uh, this is from uh, Stuyvesant Town apartment looking down from below. We're aiming, to, because this is such a low building, to uh, really celebrate the roof appearance itself, make sure we drop the corner of the building enough so it can be seen by uh, pedestrian as well as it will be seen from people's apartments above. And again, uh, uh, the, at the, in the evening uh, to achieve a kind of um, translucency for the, through the building itself, same as the, as the southern building. Oh, uh, just to recap, the material palette, uh, we'll be using uh, stainless steel for the trim and doors, and again, uh, solid glass brick for, uh, with, a, with a granite base for the perimeter and uh, flat lock tiles for the roof. So moving back into East River Park, this gives an overview of all the park structures, including the three maintenance and operations areas and the three new park buildings. The park building facade concept uh, introduces a broad spectrum of colors, helping park users to orient themselves within the park from north to south. Drawing from inspiration from the Lower East Side neighborhood, uh, we are blending these colors to give a sense of vibrancy and uh, diversity uh, for each of our park buildings. Um, the park buildings are like a family uh, utilizing design details uh, across all three, three buildings. The tennis building is about 1,500 square feet, completely ADA accessible um, with a small concession area, a, a, an office for tennis operations, and storage facilities and a new restroom for the tennis area. We're also using uh, green roofs uh, as part of Parks' uh, sustainability design initiatives on two of our park buildings. <coughs> this is the view showing the, the tennis house as it's situated in between the two tennis courts, uh, also in front of a shaded uh, and planted uh, plaza with a seating, the seating area in between. Moving further north, adjacent to the proposed track, is the track house. Um, again, utilizing all the similar design details that were developed for the park buildings. Um, and 
the square footage of this building is much larger. <laughs> it's 4,800 square feet with new ADA accessible lockers, uh, bathrooms, a larger concession stand, and a larger park office operations fa facility, and a larger storage uh, space for uh, users for the track. This is the front view of the track house uh, with a generous and welcoming plaza uh, directly adjacent to the Manhattan Greenway, also uh, framed by uh, sh shade uh, species to, pr to promote uh, canopy coverage in front of the building. Further north, uh, this is the East 10th Street Comfort Station. Again, part of that family of uh, building design with a similar design uh, details developed for ease of construction and maintainability also carrying a, a family of design narrative that relates uh, in, to the parking, really gives an identity to all these buildings. The new comfort station is, again, 100% ADA accessible, located adjacent to the East 10th Street playground and also uh, near the Esplanade and uh, picnic area. Overall, our park buildings uh, use a, a play on different material assemblies, in, including perforated and embossed uh, stainless steel panels, and a, a wide uh, um, a library of vibrant uh, glazed bricks, and uh, a green, uh, low maintenance green roofs from this park's sustainability initiatives. So that concludes our presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we will now hear public testimony. Um, please limit your testimony to three minutes. And it's very, very helpful to focus on issues of design because design is what the purview of this commission is. So please, if you can, possibly do so. Um, if you have printouts of your testimony, um, please hand them to Carrie, who will distribute them to us. Um, during the presentations and testimony, please refrain from applause, booing, and yelling. Um, and we will call all of everyone up first and then just go. Yes, That's I have four people. I Great. Have, so everyone can come up and, uh, to this table and then go in order. Uh, we have Ivy Rosado. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't read this name, but the last name is Jones from the Lower East Side Power Partnership. Uh, uh, Caroline or Caroline Wexelbaum and Daniel Tanger. You can start. Hi, my name is Ivy Ann Rosado. I'm here representing Councilwoman Carlina Rivera. Dear members of the Public Design Commission, thank you for allowing me to submit this testimony on item number 27207, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, or ESCR. It's been nearly seven years since Hurricane Sandy made landfall in New York City, but the effects of that storm had on the Lower East Side and the five boroughs can still be seen and felt today. Our neighborhood and many others are still recovering and rebuilding from the 19 billion in damage and economic losses at Sandy Rock. And for the families of the 43 New Yorkers who lost their lives, their lives will truly never be fully healed. As a former community organizer who led the emergency response to Sandy, and today as a council member who is responsible for the safety of over 160,000 New Yorkers, I understand the seriousness of the crisis we face from climate change and increased sea levels and storm surge. I also understand that $335 million of the budget for this project comes from federal FEMA funding that will, by rule, expire in 2022. If we allow those funds to disappear, this project will not be able to move forward and we will almost certainly never get that money back from a Trump administration and a Congress that has continually stripped funding for state and local infrastructure projects. That is why it is imperative that we get this project done quickly and correctly for our community. Let's be absolutely clear. The city ha is not living up to that second point. As Community Board 3 perfectly framed it in their resolution on this item, the ESCR process since fall 2018 has freed trust in government and public agencies because of the drastic change in plan done without community consultation, despite the needs of the community who look to their government to supply desperately needed protection of their lives and homes. 
It's why I demand an apology from the city and why Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and I hired an independent consultant to review the project's design. While I look forward to the results of this independent review from the Netherlands-based environmental consulting group, Del Terres, I will continue to urge the city to finally commit to other key concerns beyond the park's design. The most disappointing of all these concerns is the lack of details regarding a phased-in approach to construction. When my council colleagues and I held a hearing on this project in January, Damie Torres Springer, the first deputy commissioner of the city's Department of Design and Construction, said that we'd have more details on phase in construction in a few months. It's now September, and the city continues to drag its feet and fails to live up to its promise for honest and open communication. Residents deserve to know all the details regarding a phase in approach, and every effort must be made to ensure that residents can still enjoy sections of the park while construction continues. In addition, our community's elected officials called for an interim flood protection measures, IPFM. During construction of ESCR in a letter to our offices, DDC Commissioner Lauren Grillo wrote that while analysis of con existing conditions did not find the IPFM to be an effective solution for the ESCR area, the IPFM is not designed to protect neighborhoods from sandy level events. They can still ensure critical infrastructure remains operational during more frequent, less severe storms. The city must share its details of that analysis with our office and the independent reviewer to guarantee that our community's most important infrastructure is protected. Could you please wrap up? Yes. Thanks. So some other of our concerns that must be met include a study for long-term decking and greening of the FDR Drive, a sufficient detour for users of East River Greenway, a plan to safely move the Seal Water Park sculptures to nearby park and have them safely return to the conclusion of the project, new administrative facility with nonprofit and community space, a long-term commitment to community-approved entity to generate revenue for East River Park, a temporary site for the LES Ecology Center and surrounding neighborhood, and finalizing sufficient and alternative active passes, open spaces, mitigation, enhancements to both parks and other city agency facilities. Written confirmation that all local youth and school sports organizations will have permits near the project area at specific locations, a commitment to additional barbecue areas where they're safe and do not conflict with other recreation, and a hazardous material mitigation plan that goes beyond typical mitigation efforts to ensure the safety and health of all New Yorkers. You can uh, submit the rest of your written testimony. I can say the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. you can submit. Yeah, just okay. give us submit the paper. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Sorry, we have, to go, we have to move to the other speakers. Just this one sentence left. If the city wants my vote when this project comes to the city council, they cannot wait until our hearings to start sharing this information. They need to address these concerns now so that our community can assess all factors along with the independent review that is slated to be completed by September 23rd. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valentina Jones. I'm here on behalf of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. Our, one of our major concerns in terms of design is the Amf East River Amphitheater. Uh, presently, there are about 15.4% of the residents are age 65 or over, and 25% our uh, ages 50, 45 to 64. Uh, recently, people have talked about going to the amphitheater and having seniors and people with mobility challenges. So we advocate that the design of the East River Amphitheater include access and seating to accommodate seniors and people with mobility challenges. Um, we also had people that came that lived nearby and complained about the sound emanating from the amphitheater. And that one person said that the reason that they hadn't complained was that mainly the events are in the summer and it's not usually that many and they generally stop at nine sharp. So we advocate that there, there's some kind of sound mitigation included in the process. Um, I didn't quite understand uh, how this goes. So anyway, some of what I'm gonna say is what we plan to say tomorrow. It's not so much about design, but some of the other issues uh, that have somewhat been addressed. Um, one thing that, uh, let me just say, I'm a retired registered nurse and I have worked in the emergency room. One of the things that really concerns us is the fact that the borough president stated that 43 city residents lost their lives during Sandy and the uh, proposed action plan amendment states that in high-rise buildings during Sandy, elevators stopped working, and many older and infirm people were trapped in their apartments. So when we talk about significance, we're talking about 
people dead and people trapped in their apartment. And so that's one of the pieces in terms of significance. We also are concerned about funding, as was said, because this has been brought to the community that funding is an issue. So that is an issue for people, especially those people that live on the FDR drive, and that this would be flood protection because they went out and showed pictures. And one of the pictures shows uh, people's houses being flooded if nothing is done. So one of our issues is protection of people. And to me, that is just, I have a license as a mental health counselor to show people something like that and then say there are ways to protect you and then not to protect people is abominable. Um, so that was one of our other issues. Um, consultation, uh, one of the other things in the proposed plan, one of the things we didn't quite understand is this meeting is today. I think the borough president and city council person, their consult comes back at the end of the month. In terms of that proposed uh, plan, they state that they'll have an engineer that is going to look at everything at the end. Um, and we also got a response back from uh, the, dep the deputy director of the of DDC that stated they're committed to using Envision to evaluate this plan because that was a concern of people because originally they had did so much outreach in the community and then came back with a total different plan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caroline Wexelbaum from State Senator Brad Hoyleman's office, and I'll be reading testimony on behalf of Senator Hoyleman and Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present during the New York City Public Design Commission hearing on the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. We are State Senator Brad Hoyleman and Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. Each of our respective districts includes a large portion of the area that would be deeply impacted by this project. Our waterfront community must have protection from the threats of climate change and the disastrous effects of another Superstorm Sandy. It must also have access to green space for recreation, relaxation, appreciation of nature, and social gatherings. Unfortunately, after four years of community input on what ESCR might look like, we are now providing input on a plan unilaterally put forth by the city. As you consider the design-related issues of this proposal, we challenge you to ask, given the $1.45 billion cost of this project, the importance of its goals and the profound community impacts that the construction and closure of East River Park will have, does this design reflect our community's needs? And just as importantly, respond to the concerns that we have raised over the last year. Allow us to detail a few of these concerns. First, our community must retain access to East River Park during construction, and any design must prioritize phased construction that will allow for continued access as well as the preservation of local ecology. A multi-year closure of the entire park, estimated to be 3.5 years, caused by the project will eliminate this vital green space, waterfront views, walkways, and bike paths, all integral to our community. The project could potentially stir up hazardous material left over from the manufactured gas plants in the area, creating health impacts for the community. The proposed project would also destroy much of the existing ecology in the area, including uprooting all trees, insect habitats, and tidal wetlands. It also poses a risk to the well-being of certain species of fish in the area, including herring and striped bass. In addition, it is essential that a plan be developed and implemented to preserve any existing art in the park that will be impacted by construction. Second, any design must take into account the recommendations of the expert firm Del Chares, retained by Manhattan Borough President Brewer and Council Member Carlina Rivera in order to evaluate ESCR proposals, particularly Design Alternative 3 and Design Alternative 4. As Community Board 3, noted in its resolution on ESCR, community members have sought the creation of an expert panel to study additional protective options, including decking over the FDR, the construction of a barrier to protect NYCHA residents on lower floors, and a phasing plan for construction that ensures a timely com uh, completion of any project while mitigating the amount of time that public space is taking out of service. Any Could design process. please wrap up? We have yep. the testimony. Thank you. Should allow for this expert feedback and encourage it. 
I'm just going to skip over a couple paragraphs since you guys have it. Uh, we urge the Public Design Commission to take these concerns into account as it considers design-related testimony from our neighbors this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having this hearing. Uh, I am here representing the East River Alliance, as well as myself as a resident that has been involved in the recovery and rebuilding of the East River Park and the neighborhood of the Lower East Side since the day after Sandy's floodwaters receded. ERA has technical and community inclusion issues uh, with this plan, but uh, we are expressing those in the proper venues, so today, uh, since the Commission is looking at the preliminary design, uh, I'll speak to that. First, this design is no less a visual obstruction from the community than any of the previous plans, which they tried to say earlier today. Um, a wall is a wall. It's always going to block the view from the neighborhood, even if it's buried under a park. Uh, most importantly, though, this plan is no longer a resiliency plan for the community but a park that is designed to protect itself and hopefully still protect the neighborhood. It turns its back on the river instead of working with the river and connecting uh, park patrons and community members to the river. To this point, the city agencies have not responded to community input on design since around 2017. Uh, we asked that the wall, and some examples of that are we asked that the wall at Montgomery Street be safe and not attractive to skateboarders. It is neither as seen in the uh, design today. We asked to keep the amphitheater uh, at many community meetings uh, because it was already uh, elevated and uh, right now they're planning to change it. We asked for the shared use path to be along the river. It is set back and put away from the river we, in this design. We asked for additional embayments but only got slightly smaller replacement embayments that connect people to the river. We asked for get downs along the esplanade everywhere possible. They put some in, but that has not changed since their so-called public meetings that have happened since a, about a year ago. We asked for the Lower East Side Ecology Center compost wetland and the fireboat house to be integrated into the park plan, but we see them left outside the protection in these designs. We asked to keep the seal and other marine life sculptures in the water play area at Grand Street, and I don't see them there. At least they've gotten rid of the upside down trees that were in other preliminary plans that we saw. We asked for plantings that are reminiscent, if not functional, as the wetlands that once were a part of this site and that protected the upland areas uh, before development but we see plantings that are more like a traditional upland park in these designs. So uh, now uh, for this commission, we ask that the commission send them back, the city back to the drawing board uh, and listen to the community's asks. Thank you. Um, we're going to have the discussion from the commissioners if people have um, comments or questions for the agency presenting. Thank you very much to our um, presenters and speakers. Okay. okay, thank you very much, both the um, community and the presenters. And um, I just want to say that I think it's a um, very difficult design problem. And I appreciate the work that's going into it and the collaboration between the engineering, the landscape, and the architecture to be one thing, um, so to be able to create this wall. And I think the second scheme where it's kind of integrated within the slope is more successful. Um, it's a wall, it is a wall, <laughs> so we're given that, and um, that's not our charge, is to the engineering. But um, I had some points that I wanted to review with the uh, designers. And one was to uh, revisit the previous bridge design. Uh, you'd shown it in the renderings where it's sloping in, and I know you had to straighten it. I don't know where to look. Um, but for the, for the lighting, but I thought, uh, it, it seems that uh, since there are three bridges, all identical, that it's critical that 
Um, you know, it's a unique design that, that you've created, so it seems that a unique lighting design might be appropriate here. So rather than, you know, I know you're saying we have to go with the Parks par Department designs, but there are three of these bridges, so I think we should try to, you know, fight this battle a little bit more and try to retain that slope because the renderings didn't show that vision. I know you just got this, you know, news recently, so it'd be great to revisit that. Um, the concept for shade in the park at large, I had a question about. I see the umbrellas appearing, but I'm just, you know, would be interested in, re in, in your, I mean, you wouldn't have to respond here, but just to receive a, a concept design for shade, shade at large in the park, where it is, where you intend it to be in the future with the growth of the trees. Um, and in respect to that, um, and also since you're removing all the mature trees, because they can't be there anymore because you're raising the land, you know. So we're gonna have new trees. So what caliper are those trees that we're gonna get? So we'll know when we're gonna get the shade. And then when we don't have shade, what do we have in the meantime? Because it's gonna be hot out there, obviously a lot of time for the moms and everybody who's watching all the soccer and sports and everybody else. Um, <coughs> the wall, um, so f you stated that 50% of the new park will be the wall and um, you have these three transitions of patterns. So I think in my remarks it says to get rid of the brick pattern, but actually I think that given the investment in the length of this, I don't know how many feet, linear feet the wall is, I don't know what 50% represents, but so it's one third, one third, and one third, you kind of said, I don't know if it divides equally between pedestrian, bikes, and vehicles, you have these three different patterns. So. I mean, I'm just wondering, not that I'm advocating a busy design at all, but is there some way that we could think about it in a more nuanced way than just those three patterns? So, you know, the people who are walking get this basket weave for X for how long? So, you know, and I think the way you're stretching the design is really interesting, the way you have the, the brick weave and then it stretches. Obviously, that's what's happening. So I'm just, you know, it would be something to think, I mean, to think about, I know it's going to get, it's in preliminary design, so it'll get, you know, developed. Um, the fourth has to do with the, they're called the interceptor gate buildings, I guess, the, the DEP buildings, um, which I think are very elegant. And um, the glass block it looks really elegant. I guess there are no people in them. You showed a person, but I don't know when a person goes in there. So you've got the clerestory windows, um, which sounds great. I don't know when I get to see that. Is there lighting inside um, using this glass block, which is really ambitious and beautiful? So I just want to make sure that, and I'm sure, sure you will, <laughs> that it gets detailed. All the technical details will be there, you know, like a running block glass brick I've never seen, but I'm sure it's something, I don't know, you'll let me know. So um, just want to make sure it gets detailed really well because it's going to be there for a long time. But I think it's a very elegant design, and I'm very excited about it. Um, and then the last has to do with the, uh, just a brief note on the DPR buildings, the recreational buildings, the concept where the colors, which I think is really great. Um, and I just, you know, design, I think we also have to think about the quality of life for people in the buildings. So is it possible to put solar tubes in those buildings? Or, I know skylights are expensive, you have a green roof. Is there some way, I and mean, you could put it through a green roof, you know. So is there some way we can bring some natural light into those buildings? Um, I think that's it for my comments. So those are the five points. Thank you. Happy to discuss some of those now if you'd like us to. Or uh, I think. How, where's our? Or do you want to? We're going to. This is preliminary, here? so those conversations should take place with the staff. Okay. As as soon as you have the 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 answers, I think that's the process we generally follow. Okay. I, are there any other comments by various commissioners? So uh, we did have. Uh, we did have uh, one of our commissioners that's not able to be here today. He left uh, an inquiry about the graphics that will go on the gates, and we understand that there's sort of a larger graphic design uh, team that's being brought on board and to make sure that uh, bringing a frankly friendlier, more kind of public user friendly um, uh, lens and perspective to the graphic design along with your, your operational uh, graphic design needs are, are really important in the next step. And um, just sort of in semi-conclusion, there was a consistency among all the speakers in making sure 
that every possible um, opportunity for phasing the construction um, was something that was uh, looked at um, as a critical element to the community. Uh, I think that's going to be important to the commission as well as the progress, as the project moves forward. So I would advise the team and the agencies behind the team to have real answers to that very important um, issue brought up by, um, I think, all of our speakers. Um, and I would add, I think that the issue of the amphitheater design and whether we've really approached, whether the department and the plan really approaches that in the most um, thoughtful way in reference to issues of senior citizens and the rest, and I think we'll want to take a look at that when this um, project comes back, the several times it will have to come back. Um, so if there are no other comments, is, ah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Just, I wanted to just put an emphasis on that, which is that the community will have to live with yeah. the changes, and we're very, you know, it's not, it, the design, the functionality, act, it really means a lot to us as a commission, and we're going to be paying attention to that. So with the agencies and the designers to really think about opportunities to both make it palatable to live with in the interim phase as well as in the future, you know, the gates, for example, to not make them security. They are security. We were, we're living with a wall. We're designing a wall. But to make things as palatable as possible for daily life will be really important. Okay. I agree. Any other comments? Is there a motion from one of the commissioners to um, approve on a second? Thank you. Um, all in favor, please uh, raise your right hand. The item um, subject to the conditions that will be attached and discussed um, is approved. Thank you, and the public meeting is adjourned.